Psychology of the Unconscious by Young, Part 2, Chapter 7, The Dual Mother Role. After the disappearance of the assailant, Chiwan Topal begins the following monologue. From the extreme ends of these continents, from the farthest lowlands, after having forsaken the palace of my father, I have been wandering aimlessly during a hundred moons, always pursued by my mad desire to find her, her who will understand. With jewels I have tempted many fair ones, with kisses I have tried to snatch the secret of their hearts, with acts of bravery I have conquered their ad admiration. He reviews the woman he has known. Chita, the princess of my race, she is a little fool, vain as a peacock, having naught in her head but jewels and perfume. Tanan, the young peasant. Ba, a mere sow, no more than a breast and stomach, caring only for pleasure. And then Chima, the priestess, a true parrot, repeating hollow phrases learnt from the priests, all for show, without real education or sincerity, suspicious poser and hypocrite. Alas, not one who understands me, not one who resembles me, not one who has a soul sister to mine. There is not one among them, all who I know, I, all who know my soul, not one who, re who could read my thoughts, far from it, not one capable of seeking, of, s of seeking with me the luminous summits, or of spelling with me the superhuman word, love, end of quote. Here Chewantopo himself says that his journeying and wandering is a quest for that other, for, and for the meaning of life, which lies in union with her. In the first part of this work, we merely hinted gently at this possibility, the fact that the seeker is masculine and the sought for a feminine sex is not so astonishing, because the chief object of the unconscious transference is the mother, as has probably been seen from that which we have already learned. The daughter takes a male attitude towards the mother. The genesis of this adjustment can only be suspected in our case, because objective proof is lacking. Therefore, let us rather be satisfied with the inference, she who will understand, means the mother in the infantile language. At the same time, it also means the life companion. As is well known, the sex contrast concerns the libido but little. The sex of the object plays a surprisingly slight role in the estim estimation of the unconscious. The object itself, taken as an object of reality, is but of, is but of slight significance, but it is of greater importance whether the libido is transferred or introverted. The original concrete meaning of irfasen, to seize, begirfen, to touch, etc., allows us to recognize clearly the underside of the wish to find a congenial person. But the upper intellectual half is also contained in it and is to be taken into account at the same time. One might be inclined to assume this tendency if it were not that our culture abused the same, for the misunderstood woman has become the almost proverbial, which can only be the result of a wholly distorted valuation. On the other side, our culture undervalues most extraordinarily the importance of sexuality, on the, and on the other side, sexuality breaks out as a direct result of the repression burdened, burdening it at every place where it does not belong, and makes use of such an indirect manner of expression that one may expect to meet it suddenly almost anywhere. Thus the idea of the intimate comprehension of the human soul, which is in reality something very beautiful and pure is soiled and disagreeable, distorted through the entrance of the indirect sexual meaning. Footnote. A direct, unconstrained expression of sexuality is a natural occurrence, and as such neither unbeautiful nor repulsive. The moral repression makes sexuality on one side dirty and hypocritical, and on the other side shameless and obtrusive. End footnote. The secondary meaning, or better expressed, the misuse which, which repressed and denied sexuality forces upon the highest soul functions, makes it possible, for example, for certain of our opponents to, to, to scent in psychoanalysis purient erotic confessionals. These are subjective wish fulfillment deliria which need no contra arguments. This misuse makes the wish to be understood highly suspicious if the natural demands of life have not been fulfilled. Nature has first claim on people. Only long afterwards does the luxury of intellect come. The medieval idea 
of life for the sake of death needs gradually to be replaced by a natural conception of life in which the normal demands of people are thoroughly kept in mind, so that the desires of the animal, animal sphere may no longer be compelled to be dragged down into their service to the higher gifts of the intellectual sphere in order to find an outlet. We are inclined, therefore, to consider the dreamer's wish for understanding, first of all, as a repressed striving towards the natural destiny. This meaning coincides absolutely with psychoanalytic experience, that there are countless neurotic people who apparently are prevented from experiencing life because they have an unconscious and often a conscious repugnance to the sexual fate under which they imagine all kinds of ugly things. There is only too great an inclination to yield to this pressure of the unconscious sexuality and to experience the dreaded, unconsciously hoped for, disagreeable sexual experience so as to acquire by that means a legitimately founded horror which, reta which retains them more surely than in an infantile situation. This is the reason why so many people fall into that very state towards which they have the greatest, greatest abhorrence. That we are correct in our assumption that, in Miss Miller, it is a question of the battle for independence is shown by her statement that the hero's departure from her father's house reminds her of the fate of the young Buddha, who likewise renounced all luxury to which he was born in order to go out into the world to live out his destiny to its completion. Buddha gave the same heroic example as did Christ, who separated from his mother and even spoke bitter words, Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, think, think not, that I am come to send peace on earth. I am not. I come not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, the daughter against her mother, the son, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a fool's foes shall be thy of his they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Or Luke, chapter twelve, version fifty-one. Suppose ye that I come to give peace to the earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. Far, far from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against the three. The father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. Horace snatched from his mother her head adornment, the power, just as Adam struggled with Lilith. So he struggles for power. Nietzsche, in human all too human, expressed the very same, in the, expressed the same in very beautiful words. Quote, One may suppose that a mind in which the type of free mind is to ripen and sweeten and maturity has had its devices, its decisive crisis, in a great detachment, so that. Before this time, it is just so much the more a fettered spirit and appears chained forever in its corner and its pillar. Footnote. Compare what is said below concerning the motive of fettering. End of, end of footnote. What binds it most fir firmly? What cords are almost unter unterrible? Among human beings of high and exquisite type, it would be duties, that reverence, which is suitable for youth that modesty and tenderness for all the old, honored, and valuable things, that thankfulness for the earth from which they grew, for the hand which guided them, for the shrine which shrine where they learnt to pray, their loftiest moments themselves come to bind them the firmest, to obrogate them the most permanently, the great detachment comes suddenly for people so bound. Better to die than to live here, Thus rings the imper imperative voice of seduction, and this here, this at home, is all that is the soul has loved until now, a sudden terror and suspicion against that which it has loved, a lightning flash of scorn towards that which is called duty, a rebellious, arbitrary, volcanic, impelling desire for traveling, for strange countries, estrangements, coolness, frigidity, delusionment, a hatred of love perhaps a sacrilegious touch and a glance backwards. Footnote. The sacrilegious assault on Horus upon Isis, at which Plutarch stands ag aghast, he expresses himself as following concerning it. Quote, but if anyone wishes to assume and maintain that all this has really happened and taken place with respect to blessed and imperishable nature, 
which for the most part is considered as corresponding to the divine, then to speak in the words of Asclepius, he must spit out and clean his mouth. From this sentence one can form a conception of how the well-intentioned peoples of ancient society may have condemned the Christian point of view, first the hang god, then the management of the family, the foundation of the state. The psychologist is not surprised. End of footnote. So where we were. A hatred of love, perhaps a sacrilegious touch and glance backwards. There were just now, it adorned and loved, perhaps a blush of shame over that would which it has just done, and at the same time an exhalation over having done it, an intoxicating internal joyous thrill, in which the victory reveals itself, a victory. Over what? Over whom? An enigmatic, doubtful, questioning victory, but the first triumph. Of such woe and pain is formed the history of the great detachment. It is like a disease which can destroy people, this first eruption of strength and will towards self-assertion. So footnote, compare the typical fate of Theseus and Paratheus. The danger lies, as is brilliantly expressed by Nietzsche, in isolation in oneself. Quote, Solitude surround and embraces him ever more threatening, ever more constricting, ever more heart strangling the terrible goddess and might der survey cupidinum. End of quote. The libido taken away from the mother who is abandoned only reluctantly, becomes threatened as a serpent, the symbol of death. For the relation to the mother must cease, must die, which itself almost causes man's death. In Maitir Severa Cupidinum, the idea attains rare, almost conscious perfection. I do not presume to try to paint in better words than has Nietzsche the psychology of the wretch from childhood. Ms. Miller furnishes us with a further reference to a, mater to a material which has influenced her creation in a more general manner. This is the great Indian epic of Longfellow, the Song of Hiawatha. If my, reader, if my readers have had patience to read thus far and to reflect upon what they have read, they frequently must have wondered at the number of times I introduced for comparison such apparently foreign material and how often I widened the base upon which Miss Miller's creations rest. Doubts must often have been raised, have, risen, have arisen whether it is justifiable to enter into important discussion concerning the psychologic foundations of myths, religions, and cultures in general on the basis of such scanty suggestions. It might be said that behind the Miller fantasies such a thing is scarcely to be found. I need hardly emphasize the fact that I, too, have sometimes been in doubt I have never read Hiawatha until, in the course of my work, I came to this part. Hiawatha, a poetical compilation of into Indian myths, gives me, however, a justification for all preceding reflections, because this epic contains an unusual number of mythological problems. This fact is probably of great importance for the wealth of suggestion in the Mellow Fantasies. We are therefore compelled to obtain an insight into this epic. Nawa Daha sings the song of the epic of the hero of Hiawatha, the friend of man. Quote, there he sang of Hiawatha, sang the song of Hiawatha, sang his wondrous birth and being, how he prayed and how he fasted, how he lived and toiled and suffered, that the tribes of men might prosper, prosper that he might advance his people. Quote. The teleological meaning of the hero as that symbolic figure which unites itself in libido in the form of admiration and utter adoration in order to lead to higher sublimations by way of the symbolic bridges of the myth is anticipated here. Thus we become quickly acquainted with Hiawatha as a savior and are prepared to hear all that which must be said of a savior, of his marvelous birth, of his great early deeds, and his sacrifice for his fellow men. The first song begins with a fragment of evangelism. Gichimanito, the master of life, tired of the quarrels of his human children, calls his people together and makes known to them the joyous message, quote, I will send a prophet to you, a, deliver a deliverer of the nations, who shall guide you and shall teach you, who shall toil and suffer with you. If you listen to his counsels, you will multiply and prosper. If his warnings pass unheeded, you will fade away and perish, end of quote. Gitchi Manito, the mighty, the creator of nations, is represented as he stood erect on the great 
pipestone quarry, quote, from his footsteps flowered a river, leapt into the light of morning, over the precipice plunged downward, gleamed like Ikuda the comet, end quote. The water flowing from his footsteps sufficiently proves the phallic nature of this creator. I refer to the early utterances concerning the phallic and fertilizing nature of the, hose, of the horse's foot and the horse's steps, and especially do I recall Hippocrene and the foot of Pegasus. Footnote. Compare the example given for that in uh, um, Agirmo, also part one of this book, The Foot of the Sun in the Armenian Folk Prayer. End of footnote. We met... And we meet the same idea in Psalm um, 65, 20, uh, version, verses 9 to 11. Quote, thou, visit, thou visitest the earth and water it. Thou makest it very plenteous. The river of God is full of water. Thou preparest their corn, for thou providest for the earth. Thou waterest her furrows. Thou sendest rain into the little valleys thereof. Thou make it soft with drops of water, and blessed the increase of it. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness, and thy paths drop fatness. Wherever the fertilizing God steps, there is fruitfulness. We already have spoken of the symbolic meaning of Tre treading and discuss in discussing the nightmares. Kynaeus passes into the depths, quote, splitting the earth with a foot outstretched, unquote. Amphiphyreus, another Catholic hero, sinks into the earth, which Zeus has opened for him by a stroke of lightning. Compare that with the above message vision of a hysterical patient who saw a black horse after a flash of lightning, identity of horse's footsteps and flashes of lightning. By means of a flash of lightning, heroes are made immortal. Faust attained the mother's when he stamped his foot. Stamp and descend, stamping thou rise again. The heroes in the sun-devouring myths often stamp at or st struggle at the, in the jaws of the monster. Thus Tor stamped through the ship's bottom in the battle with the monster and went as far as the bottom of the sea, Kynaeus, concerning kicking as an infantile fantasy see above. The regression of the libido to the presexual stage makes this preparatory action of treading either a substitution for the coitus fantasy or for the fantasy of reenacting, of re-entrance into the mother's womb. The comparison of water flowing from the footsteps with a comet is a light symbol is a light symbolism for the fructifying moisture sperma. According to an observation by Humboldt, Cosmos, certain South American Indian tribes called the meteors urine of the stars. Mention is also made of how the Gitchik Manito makes fire. He blows upon a forest so that the trees, rubbing upon each other, burst into flame. This demon is, therefore, an excellent libido symbol. He also produced fire. After this prologue in the second song, the hero's previous history is related. The great warrior... Mujikiwis, Hiawatha's father, has cunningly overcome the great bear, the terror of the nations, and stolen from him the magic belt of wumpum, a girdle of shells. Here we meet the motive of the treasure attained with difficulty, which the hero rescues from the monster. Who the bear is is shown by the poetic's, poet's comparisons. Mujikiwis Kiwis, strikes the bear on its head after he robbed him of his treasure. Quote, with a heavy blow bewildered rose the great bear of the mountains, but his knees beneath him trembled, and he whispered, and he whimpered like a woman, unquote. Majikiwis said derisively to him, quote, Else you would not cry and whimper like a miserable woman, but you, bear, sit here and whimper and disgrace your tribe by crying like a wretched shugodaya, like a cowardly old woman, end of, end of. These three comparisons with a woman are to be found near each other on the same page. Mujikiwis has, like a true hero, more, once more torn life from the jaws of death, from the all-devouring, terrible mother. This deed, which as we have seen is also represented in a journey to hell, night journey through the sea, the conquering of the monster from within, signifies at the same time entrance into the mother's womb, a rebirth, the results of which are perceptible also from Mujikiwis. As in the Zosimos 
version vi, vision here to the entering here to here the entering one becomes the breath of the wind or spirit Majikiwas becomes the west wind the fertilizing breath the father of winds footnotes Porphyrus de Anthronympharium, quoted by Dietrich, says that according to the Mithric doctrine, the souls which pass away at birth are destined for winds, for winds because these souls had taken the breath of the wind into custody and therefore had a similar nature. Fuxius Dias Genisin Eosias Kai Apor Genisios Xauri Zu Menais Aix Otas Etaxe Enamus Dia Ta Ephile Ephixi Sestai Kai Autos Pneuma Kai Oisinian Exine Toyotin translated the souls departing at birth and becoming separated probably become winds winds because of inhaling their breath and becoming the same substance and a footnote his sons become the other winds and intermitso tells of them and of their love stories of which i will mention only the courtship of waboons the east wind because here the erotic wooing of the wind is pictured in an especially beautiful manner every morning he sees a beautiful girl in a meadow whom he eagerly courts Quote, every morning grazing earthward, still the first thing he beheld there was her blue eyes looking at him, two blue lakes among the rushes. End of quote. The comparison with water is not a matter of secondary importance because from wind and water shall man be born anew. Quote, and he wooed her with caresses, wooed her with his smile of sunshine, with his flattering words he wooed her, with his sighing and his singing gentlest whispers in the branches, softest music, sweetest odors, sweetest odors, etc. End of quote. In these onomatic verses, the wind's caressing courtship is excellently expressed. Footnote. In the mythic liturgy, the generating breath of the spirit comes from the sun, probably the tube of the sun. Corresponding to this idea, in the Rig Veda, the sun is called the one-footed. Compared with that, the Armenian prayer for the sun is allowed its foot is for the sun to compared with that the Armenian prayer for the sun to allow its foot to rest upon the face of the suppliant. End of footnote. The third song presents the previous sister of Hiawatha's mother. His grandmother, when a maiden, lived in the moon. There she once sung upon a liana, but a jealous lover cut off the liana, and Nokomis, Hiawatha's grandfather, fell to earth. The people who saw her fell, fall downwards thought she was a shooting star. This marvelous descendant of Nokomis is more plainly illustrated by a later passage of the same song. Here little Hiawatha asks the grandfather, what is the moon? Nokomis teaches him about it as follows. The moon is the body of the grandmother, whom a warlike grandson has cast up there in wrath. Hence the moon is the grandmother. In ancient beliefs, the moon is also gathering, the gathering place of the departed souls. Footnote. Firmircus maternus, qui an animo descendus par orbem solis triburtur, per orbem vero lunae preparatur ascensus. Uh, de, so that means, for which soul a descendant through the disk of the sun is devised, but the ascent is prepared through the disk of the moon. Lydus tells us that the hy hierophant pretic status has said that the Janus dis dispatches the diviner soul to the lunar fields. Tais Theotepatus Fuxus Epitin Selin Nixon Coron Apopae Pai um, So Epiphanius Oti ex town Fuxon Odixios Tes Selenis Apopo Apopo Ibn Planti, quoted by Cumont. In exoticness, it is the same with the moon. Okay. 
So, in the ancient beliefs, well, the moon is also the gathering place of departed souls. So we had that footnote. The guardian of seeds. Therefore, once more, a place of the origin of life, of predominantly feminine significance. The remarkable thing is that Nokomis, falling upon the earth, gave birth to a daughter, we non ha subsequently the mother of Hiawatha. The throwing upwards of the mother and her falling down and bringing forth seems to contain something typical in itself. Thus the story of the 17th century relates that a mad bull threw a pregnant woman as high as a house, tore open her womb, and the child fell without harm upon the earth. On account of this wonderful birth, this child was considered a hero or doer of miracles, but he died at an early age. The belief is widespread among lower savages that the sun is feminine and the moon is masculine. Among the Namakwa, the Hottentop tribe, the opinion is prevalent that the sun consists of a transparent bacon. Quote, the people who journeyed on boats drew it down by magic every evening, cut off a suitable piece, and gave it a kick so that it flies up again to the sky. End of quote. The infantile nourishment comes from the mother. In the Gnostic fantasies, we come across a legend of the origin of man, which possibly belongs here. The female archons bound to the vault of heaven are unattainable, unattainable on account of its quick rotation to keep the young within them. But let them fall upon the earth from which men arise. Possibly there is here a, a connection with the barbaric midwifery, the letting fall of the parturient. The assault upon the mother is already introduced with the advancing, with the, sorry, with the adventure of Majikiwis and is continued in the violent handling of the grandmother, Nokomis, who, as a result of the cutting of the liana and fall downwards, seems in some way to have become pregnant. The cutting of the branch, the plucking, we have already recognized as mother incest. That well-known verse, Saxon, where beautiful maidens grow upon trees, and phrases like picking the cherries in a neighbor's garden allude to a similar idea. The fall downwards of Nokomis deserves to be compared to a poetical figure in Hain. Quote, a star, a star is falling out of the glittering sky. A star of love, I watch it sink in the depths and die. The leaves and buds are falling from many an apple tree. I watch the mirthful breezes embracing, embrace them wantonly. End of quote. Wanonha later was courted by the caressing west wind and becomes pregnant. Wanonha, as a young moon goddess, as the beauty of the moonlight, Nokomis warns her of the dangerous courtship of Maj Majikiwis, the west wind, but Winonha allows herself to become infatuated and conceives from the breath of the wind, from the pneuma, our, our, a son, our hero. Quote, and the west wind came at evening, found the beautiful Winona, lying there amid the lilies, wooed her with his words of sweetness, wooed her with his soft caresses, till she bore a son in sorrow, bore a son of love and sorrow. End of quote. Fertilization through the breath of spirit is already well known, a well-known precedent for us. The star or comet plainly belongs to the birth scene as a libido symbol. Nokomis, too, comes to earth as a shooting star. Moriki's sweet poetic fantasy has devised a similar divine origin. Quote, and she bore me in her womb and gave me food and clothing. She was a maid, a wild brown maid who looked on men with loathing. She, flee she fleered at them and laughed out loud and bade no suitor tarry. I'd rather be the wind's own bride than have a man and marry. Then came the wind and held her fast, his captive love enchanted, and lo, by him a merry child within her womb was planted. And... Buddha's marvelous birth story, we are told by Sir Edwin Arnold, shows traces of this. So, footnote, the light of Asia, or the great renunciation. So, quote, Maya the queen dreamed a strange dream, dreamed from a star, that a, that a star from heaven, splendid, six-rayed, in color, rosy pearl, whereof the token was an elephant, six-tusked six and white as milk, of Kamad, Kamad Hook, shot through the void, shining upon her, shining into her, entered her womb upon the night. Uh, end of quote footnote. One sees upon corresponding representations how the elephant presses into the Maya's head with its trunk. End of footnote. During Maya's conception, a wind blows over the land. So here we quote. 
a wind blew with unknown freshness over lands and seas, end of quote. After the birth, the four genii of the east, west, south, and north come to render service as bearers of the palanquin, the coming of the wise men at Christ's birth. We also find here a distinct reference to the four winds. For the completion of the symbolism, there is to be found in the Buddha myth, as well as in the birth legend of Christ, besides the impregnation by star and wind, also the fertilization by an animal, here an elephant, with which its phallic with, with which its phallic trunk filled, fulfilled in Maya the Christian method of fructification through the ear or the head. It is well known that, in addition to the dove, the unicorn also is also a procreative symbol of the logos. Here arises the question why the birth of a hero always had to take place under such a strange symbolic circumstance. It might also be imagined that a hero arose from ordinary surroundings and gradually grew out of his inferior environment, perhaps with a thousand troubles and dangers, and indeed this motive is by no means strange in the myth in the hero myth. It might be said that the superstition demands strange conditions of birth and generation, but why does it demand them? The answer to this question is that the birth of the hero, as a rule, is not that of an ordinary mortal but it is a rebirth from the mother spouse. Hence, it occurs under mysterious ceremonies. Therefore, in the very beginning, lies the motive of the two mothers of the hero. As rank, and here footnote, rank, the myth of the birth of the hero, translated by W. White, as rank has shown us through many examples, the hero is often obliged to experience exposure and upbringing by foster parents, and in this matter, he acquires the two mothers. A striking example is the relation of Heracles to Hera, in the Hiawatha epic, Winona dies after the birth and Nokomis takes her place. Maya dies after the, after the birth. Uh, footnote. So the speedy dying of the mother or the separation of the mother belongs to the myth of the hero. In the myth of the swan maiden, which Rank has analyzed very beautifully, there is the wish-fulfilling thought that the swan maiden can fly away again after the birth of the child because she has then fulfilled her purpose. Man needs the mother only for rebirth. End of footnote. So Maya dies from the birth, and Buddha is given a stepmother. The stepmother is sometimes an animal, the she-wolf of Romulus and Remus. The twofold mother may be replaced by the motive of the twofold birth, which has attained the lofty significance in the Christian mythology, namely through baptism, which, as we have seen, represents rebirth. This man is born not merely in a commonplace manner, but also born again in a mysterious manner by which he becomes a pre, uh, participator, participator of the kingdom of God, of immortality. Anyone may become a hero in this way who is generated anew through his own mother, because only through her does he share immortality. Therefore it happened that the death of Christ on the cross, which creates universal salvation, was understood as baptimus, baptism, that is to say, as rebirth through the second mother, the mysterious tree of death. Christ says, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am straightened till it be accomplished. Luke 12, verse 50. He interprets his death ag agony symbolically as birth agony. The motive of the two mothers suggests the thought of self-rejuvenation and evidently expresses the fulfillment of the wish that it might be possible for the mother to bear me again. At the same time, applied to the heroes, it means one is a hero who was born again by her who has previously been his mother, that is to say, a hero is he who may again produce himself through his mother. The countless suggestions in the history of the procreation of the heroes indicate the latter formulations. Hiawatha's father first overpowered his the mother under the symbol of the bear, then himself became a god, he procreates the hero. What Hiawatha had to do as a hero, Nokomis no hinted at hinted to him in the, legend, in the legend of the origin of the moon. 
He is forcibly to throw his mother upwards or throw downwards. Then she would become pregnant by this act of violence and could bring forth a daughter. This rejuvenated mother would be allotted, according to the Egyptian rite, as the daughter wife of the sun god, the father of his mother, for self reproduction. What action Hiawatha takes in this regard we shall see presently. We have already studied the behavior of the pre Asiatic gods related to Christ. Concerning the pre existence of Christ, the Gospel of St. John is full of this thought. Thus, the speech of John the Baptist quote, This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. John uh, 1 20. Also, the beginning of the Gospel is full of deep mythologic significance. Quote, In the beginning was the Word. And the word was God, and the world, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined from darkness, and the darkness comprehended not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. This is the proclamation of the reappearing light, the reborn sun, which formerly was and will begin again. In the baptistry of Pisa, at Pisa, Christ is represented bringing the tree of life to man. His head is surrounded by a sun halo. Over this relief stand the words, Intro, Introitus Solus. Because the one born with his own procreator, the history of his procreation is strangely concealed under symbolic events, which are meant to conceal and deny it. Hence the extraordinary asser assertion of the virgin conception. This is meant to hide the incestuous impregnation. But do not let us forget that this naive assertion plays an unusually important part in the ingenious symbolic bridge, which is to guide the libido out from the incestuous bond to a higher, more useful applications, which indicate a new kind of immortality, that is to say, immortal work. The environment of Hiawatha's youth is of importance. Quote, by the shores of Gitchdumi, by the shining big sea water, um, stood the wigwam of Nokomis, daughter of the moon at Nokomis. Dark behind it rose the forest, rose the black and gloomy pine trees, rose the firs and cones upon them, brought it before, brought before it, beat the water, beat the clear and sunny water, beat the shining big sea water. Unquote. In this environment, Nokomis brought him up. Here she taught him first words and told him the first fairy tales, and the sounds of the water and the wood were intermingled, so that she, so that the child learned not only to understand man's speech, but also that of nature. Quote, at the door of summer evening sat the little Hiawathe, here heard the whisperings of the pine trees, heard the lapping of the water, sounds of music, sounds of wonder, mini wawa, said the pine trees, pine trees, mudway, Ayushuka, said the water, footnote to Miniwala, the Indian word for the rustle of the wind in the trees, footnote to Mother, Ayushuka, means the sound of the waves. Hiawatha hears human speech in the sound of nature, thus he understands nature's speech. The wind says, wah, wah, the cry of the wild goose is, wah, 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 taisi means the small glowworm which enchants him. Thus the poet paints most beautifully the gradual gathering of external nature into the compass of the subjective, but not just subjective, an introduction of the object into the subject in the sense of Lorenzi, the Gegenwurf or Windowwurf objective of the mystics Eckhart and Bohm, and the footnote. So into the compass of the subjective and the intimate connection of the primary object to which the first listening words were applied and from which the first sounds were derived, with the secondary object, the wider nature which usurps imperceptibly the mother's place and takes possession of these, uh, of these sounds heard first from the mother, 
but also of those feelings which we all discover later in ourselves, in the warm love of Mother Nature. The later blend, the latter blending, whether pantheistic, philosophic, or aesthetic, or aesthetic, of the sentimental, cultured man with nature is, looked at retrospectively, a re-blending with the mother, who was our primary object and with whom we truly were once wholly one. Footnote. Carl Joel says, well, Life does not diminish in artists and prophets, but is enhanced. They are the leaders into the lost paradise, which now for the first time becomes the paradise to the rediscovery. It is no more the dull, old, dull unity of life towards which artists strive and leads. It is the sentiment the union, not the empty, but the full unity, not the unity of indifference, but the unity of difference. End of quote. Quote again. All life is the raising of the equilibrium and the pulling backwards into the equilibrium. Such a return do we find in religion and art. End of quote. Therefore, it is not astonishing when we see again emerging into the poetical speech of the modern philosopher Carl Joel, the old picture which symbolized the unity with the mother, illustrated by the confluence of subject and object. In his recent book, Stil und Welt, 1912, Joel writes as follows in the chapter called the Primal Experience. Footnote. By the primal experience, we must be understood that first human differentiation between subject and object, the first conscious placing of object, which is not psychologically conceivable without the presupposition of an inner division of the animal man from himself, by which precisely is he separated from nature, which is at one with itself. End of footnote. So, another quote. I lay on the seashore, the shining waters glittering in my dreamy eyes. At a great distance fluttered the soft breeze, throbbing, shimmering, stirring, lulling to sleep comes the wave beat to the shore, or to the ear? I do not know. Distance and nearness become blurred into one, without and within glide into each other. Nearer and nearer, dearer and more home-like sounds the beating of the waves. Now, like a thundering pulse in my head, it strikes, and now it beats over my soul, devours it, embraces it, while it itself at the same time floats out like the blue waste of waters. Yes, without and within are one, Listening and foaming, flowing and fanning and roaring, the entire symphony of the stimuli experience sounds in one tone. All thought becomes one thought, which becomes one with feeling. The world exhales in the soul, and the soul dissolves in the world. Our life, our small life, is encircled by our great sleep, the sleep of our cradle, the sleep of our grave, the sleep of our home from which we go forth in the morning, to which we again return in the evening. A life, but the short journey, the interval between the emergence from the original oneness to the shrinking back into it. Blue shimmers the infinite sea, wherein dreams the, je dreams the jellyfish of the prim primitive life, towards which, towards which without ceasing our thoughts hark back dimly through eons of existence. For every happening implies a change and a guarantee of the unity of life. At that moment, when we are no longer blended together, in that instant man lifts his head, blind and dripping from the depths of the stream of experience, from the oneness with the experience. At that moment of parting, when the unity of life is startled, surprised, detached, that detaches the change and holds it away from himself, as something alien. At this moment of alienation, the aspects of the experience have been substantialized into subject and object, and in that moment, consciousness is born. Joel paints here in unmistakable symbolism the confluence of subject and object as the reunion of mother and child. The symbols agree with this with those with those of mythology, even in their details. The encircling and devouring motive is distinctly suggested. Suggested the sea devouring the sun and giving birth to it anew is already an old acquaintance. The moment of the rise of consciousness, the separation of subject and object, is a birth. Truly philosophical thought hangs with lame wings upon a few great primitive pictures of human speech above the simple, all-surpassing greatness of which no thought can rise. The idea of the jellyfish is not accidental. Once 
when I was explaining to a patient the maternal significance of water in this in this contact with the mother complex, she experienced a very unpleasant feeling. It makes me squirm, she said, as if I touched a jellyfish. Here, too, the same idea. The blessed state of sleep before birth and after death is, as Joel observed, something like old shadowy memories of that unsuspecting thoughtless state of early childhood, whereas yet no opposition disturb the peaceful flow of dawning life, to which the inner longings always draws us back again and again, and from which the active life must free itself anew with struggles and death, so that it may not be doomed to destruction. Long before Joel, an Indian chieftain had said the same thing in similar words to one of the restless wise men, quote, Ah, my brother, you will never learn to know the happiness of thinking nothing doing nothing. This is the next sleep. This is the most delightful thing there is. Thus we were, birth, we were before birth, thus we shall be after death. End of quote. We shall see in Hiawatha's later fate how important his early impressions are in his choice of a wife. Hiawatha's first deed was to kill a roebuck with his arrow. Quote, Dead he lay there in the forest by the floor of the end of quote. This is typical of Hiawatha's deeds. Whenever he kills, for the most part, lies next or in the water, sometimes half in the water and half on the land. Footnote. The dragons of the Greek and Swiss legends live in or near springs or other waters of which they are often guardians. It seems that this must well be so. The latter adventures will teach us why this must be so. The buck was no ordinary animal, but a magic one, that is to say, one with additional unconscious significance. Hiawatha made for himself gloves and moccasins from his hide, and gloves imparted such strength to his arms that he could crumble rocks to dust, and the moccasins had the virtue of seven league boots. By enwrapping himself in the buck's skin, he really became a giant. This motive, together with the death of the animal afford, footnote, compare the discussion above about the encircling and devouring motive. Water as a hindrance in dreams seems to refer to the mother longing for the mother instead of positive work. The crossing of water, overcoming of resistance, that is to say the mother, is a symbol for the longing of, for inactivity like sleep or death. And, so this moment, motive, together with the death of the animal that soared in the water, reveals the fact that the parents that that the parents are concerned whose gigantic proportions as compared with the child are of great significance in the unconscious. The toys of giants is a wish inversion of the infantile fantasy. The dream of an 11-year-old girl expresses this, quote, I am as high as a church steeple. Then a policeman comes. I tell him, if you say anything, I'll cut off your head. End of quote. The policeman, is the, as the analysis brought out, referred to the father, whose gigantic size was overcompensated by the church steeple. In Mexican human sacrifices, the gods were represented by criminals who were slaughtered and flayed, and the Corybantes then clothe themselves in the bloody skins in order to illustrate the insurrection, the resurrection of the gods. Footnote. Compare also to the Attic custom of sucking a bull in spring, the custom of the, the Precalium, the Saturnalia, etc. I have devoted to this motive a separate investigation, therefore I forego for the proof. And the footnote. The snake's casting off his skin as a symbol of rejuvenation. Hiawatha has, therefore, conquered his parents, primarily the mother, although in the form of a male animal, compare the bear of Mojikiwis, and from that comes his giant strength. He has taken on the parent's skin and now has himself become a great man. Now he started forth on his first great battle to fight with the father, Mojikiwis, in order to avenge his dead mother, Wenonah. Naturally, under this figure of speech, hides the thought that he slays the father in order to take possession of the mother. Compare the battle of Gilgamesh with the giant Trimbaba and the ensuing conquest of Ishtar. The father, in the psychologic sense, merely represents the personification of the incest prohibition, that is to say, resistance, which defends the mother. Instead of the father, it may be a fearful animal, the great bear, the snake, the dragon, etc., which must be fought and overcome. The hero is a hero because he sees in every difficulty of life resistance to the forbidden treasure and fights that resistance with the complete yearning 
which strives towards the treasure, attainable and with difficulty, or unattainable, attainable, the yearning which paralyzes and kills the ordinary man. Hiawatha's father is Maji, Majikiris, the West Wind. The battle, therefore, takes place in the West. Thence comes life, in cognition of Winona, and thence comes death, death of Winona. Hiawatha, therefore, fights the typical battle of the hero for rebirth in the Western Sea, the battle of a devouring, terrible mother, this time in the form of the father, Majikiris, who himself has acquired a divine nature, though he conquered, he, that through his conquest of the bear, now is overpowered by his son. So back retreated Majikiwis, rushing westward over the mountains, stumbling westward down the mountains, three whole days retreating, fight, retreating, fighting, still pursued by Hiawatha to the doorways of the west room, to the portals of the sunset, to the earth's remotest borders, where into the empty spaces sinks the sun as a flamingo drops into her nest at nightfall. The three days are a stereotyped form of representing the stay in the sea prison at night, 21st until 24th of December. Christ, too, remained three days in the underworld. The treasure, difficult to attain, is captured by the hero during the struggle in the West. In this case, the father must make a great concession to the son. He gives him divine nature. But in the Gilgamesh epic, it is directly said that the immortality which the hero goes it is immortality which the hero goes to attain. End footnote. So he gives him divine nature, that that very wind nature, the immortality of which alone protected Majikius from death. He says to his son, quote, I shall rule my kingdom with you. Ruler shall you be henceforth of the northwest wind, he way then of the home wind, he way then. But Hiawatha is now beco now becomes a ruler of the home wind, has its close parallel with the Gilgamesh epic, where Gilgamesh finally receives the magic herb from the wise Utnapishtim, who dwells in the west, which brings him safe once more over the sea to his home. But this, when he is home again, is retaken from him by a serpent. When one has slain the father, one, has, one can obtain, obtain possession of his wife. And when one, when one has conquered the mother, one can free oneself. On the return journey, Hiawatha stops at the clever arrow makers who possesses a lovely daughter. And he named her from the river and the waterfall he named her Minihaha, laughing water. End quote. When Hiawatha, in his earliest childhood dreaming, felt the sounds of water and wind press upon his ears, he, he recognizing in these sounds of nature, the speech of a mo as his mother, he recognized this. The murmuring of pine trees on the shore of the great sea said, Mini Waha, Wawa. And above the murmuring of the winds and the splashing of the water, he found his earliest childhood dreams once again in a woman, Mini Haha, the laughing water. And my hero, before all others, finds in woman the mother in order to become a child again and finally to solve the riddle of immortality. The fact that Miniha's father is a skilled arrow maker betrays him as the father of the hero and the woman he had with him as the mother. The father of the hero is very often a skilled carpenter or other artisan. According to an Arabian, a Arabian legend, Tare, Abraham's father was a skillful master workman who could carve arrows from any wood, that is to say, in the Arabian form of speech, he was a procreator, of splendid sons. Footnote. Compare the symbolism of the arrow above. End footnote. But moreover, he was a maker of images of God. To Vashtar, Agni's father, is the maker of the world, a smith and carpenter, and discoverer of fire boring. Joseph, father of Jesus, was also a carpenter. Likewise, Kinyuras, Adonis' father, who is said to have invented the hammer, the lever, roofing, and mining. Hephaestus, the father of Hermes, is an artistic master of workmen is an artistic master workman and sculptor. In fairy tales, the father of the hero is very modestly in the traditional woodcutter. These conceptions were also alive in the cult of Osiris. There the divine image was carved out of a tree trunk and then placed within the hollow of a tree. Fraser's Green Golden Bur Bow Part four. 
In Rig Veda, the world was also hewn out of a tree by the wolf wood sculptor. The hero that the, the idea is that the hero is his own procreator. Footnote. <clears throat> this thought is generally organized in the doctrine of pre-existence. Thus, in any case, man is his own generator, immortal and hero, and a hero, whereby the highest wishes are fulfilled. End footnote. So the idea is that the hero is his own procreator, leads to the fact that he is invested with paternal attributes, and reversibly, the heroic attributes are given to the father. In Mani, there exists a beautiful union of the motives. He accomplishes his great labors as a religious founder, hides himself for years in a cave. He dies, is skinned and stuffed, and hung, hero. Besides, he is an artist and has a crippled foot. A similar union of motives is found in, the, in Wieland the smith. Hiawatha kept silent about what he saw at the arrow makers on his return to Nokomis, and he did nothing further to win Minnehaha. But now something happened which, if it were not in an Indian epic, would rather be sought in the history of a neurosis. Hiawatha introverted his lib libido, that is to say, he fell into an extreme resistance against the real sexual demand, Freud. He built a hut for himself in the woods in order to fast there and to experience dreams and visions. For the first three days he wandered, as once in his earlier youth, through a forest and looked at all the animals and plants. Quote, Master of life, he cried, desponding, must our lives depend on these things? Unquote. The question whether our lives must depend on these things is very strange. It sounds as if life are derived from these things, that is to say, from nature in general. Nature seems suddenly to have assumed a very strange significance. This phenomenon can be explained only through the fact that a great amount of libido was stored up and now given to nature. All is well known. Men of even dull and prosy minds in the springtime of love suddenly become aware of nature and even make poems about it. But we know that libido, prevented from an actual way of transference, always reverts to an earlier way of transference. Minihaha, the laughing water, is so clearly an allusion to the mother that the secret yearning of the hero for the mother is powerfully touched. Therefore, without having undertaken anything, he goes home to Nokomis. But there again he is driven away because Minihaha already stands in his path. He turns, therefore, even further away into that early youthful period which tones the tones of which we call Minihaha most forcibly in his thoughts, where he learned to hear the mother sounds and the sounds of nature. In this very strange revival of the impressions of nature, we recognize a regression to those earliest and strongest nature impressions which stand next to the subsequently extinguished, even stronger impressions which the child received from the mother. The glamour of this feeling for her is transferred to other objects of childish environment, father's house, playthings, etc., from which later these, those magic, blissful feelings proceed, which seem to be peculiar in the earliest childhood memories. When, therefore, Hiawatha hides himself in the lap of nature, it is really the mother's room, and it is to be expected that he will emerge again, newborn in some form. Before turning in this new creation arising from introversion, there is still a further significance of the preceding question to be considered, whether life is dependent upon these things. Life may be dependent upon these things in the, de in the degree that they serve for nourishment, we must infer in this case that suddenly the question of nutrition came very near to the hero's heart. This possibility would be thoroughly proven in what follows. The question of nutrition, indeed, enters seriously into consideration. First, because regression to the mother necessarily revives the special path of transference, namely that of nutrition through the mother. As soon as the libido regresses to the presexual stage, there we may expect to see the function of nutrition and its symbols put in place of the sexual function. Thence is derived an essential root of the displacement from below upwards, Freud, because in the presexual stage the principal value belongs not to the genitals but to the mouth. Secondly, because the hero fasted, his hunger became predominant. Fasting, as is well known, is employed to silence sexuality. Also, it expresses symbolically the resistance against sexuality, translated into the language of the pre-sexual stage. On the fourth day of the fast, the hero ceased to address himself to nature. He lay exhausted with eyes half closed upon his couch, sunk deep in dreams, the picture of extreme introversion.
We have already seen that in such circumstances, an infantile internal equivalent for reality appears in the place of external life and reality. This is also the case with Hiawatha. Quote, and he saw a youthful approach, a youth approaching, dressed in garments green and yellow, coming through the purple twilight, through the splendor of the sunset. Plumes of green bent over his forehead, with his hair soft and golden. Unquote. This remarkable apparition reveals himself in the following manager Hiawatha. Quote, From the master of life descending, I, the friend of man, Mondamin, come to warn you and to instruct you how by struggle and by labor you shall gain what you have prayed for. Rise up from your bed of branches, rise, O youth, and wrestle with me. End quote. Mondamin is the maize, a god who was eaten arising from Hiawatha's introversion. His hunger taken in a double sense, his longing for the nourishing mother, gives birth from his soul to another hero, the edible maize, the son of the earth mother. Therefore, he again arises at sunset, symbolizing the entrance into the mother, and in the western sunset glows, he begins again the mystic struggle with the self-created god, the god who has originated entirely from the longing for the nourishing mother. The struggle is again the struggle for a liberation, from the destructive and yet productive longing. One daemon is, therefore, equivalent to the mother, and the struggle with him means the overpowering and impregnation of the mother. This interpretation is entirely proven by the myth of the Cherokees, who, quote, invoke at the maze under the name of the old woman in allusion to a myth that sprang from the blood of an old woman killed by her disobedient sons, end quote. And then we have a quote. Faint with famine, Hiawatha started from his bed of branches, from the twilight of his wigwam, forth into the flush of sunset, came and wrestled with Mondamin. At his touch he felt now courage, throbbing in his brain and bosom, felt new life and hope and vigor, run through with every nerve and fiber. End quote. The battle at sunset with the god of the maze gives Hiawatha new strength, and thus it must be because the light for the individual depths, again against the paralyzing longing for the mother, gives creative strength to men. Here, indeed, is a source for all creation, but it demands heroic courage to fight against these forces and to wrestle them, and to wrest them from treasure difficult to attain. Quote, unquote. He who succeeds in this has, in truth, attains the best. Hiawatha wrestles with himself for his creation. Afutnut, thou seekest the heaviest burden, there findest thou thyself. Nietzsche from Zarathustra. And a footnote. The struggle lasts again the charmed three days. The fourth day, just as Mondamon prophesied, Hiawatha conquers him, and Mondamon sinks to the ground in death. As Mondamon previously desired, Hiawatha digs his grave in Mother Earth, and soon afterwards, from this grave, the young and fresh maize grows for the nourishment of mankind. Concerning the thought of this fragment, we have herein a beautiful parallel to the mystery of Mithra, where first the battle of the hero with his bull occurs. Afterwards, Mithra carries in Transitus the bull into the cave where he kills him. From this death, all fertility grows, all that is edible. Footnote. It is an unvarying particularity, so to speak, that in the whale dragon myth, the hero is very hungry in the belly of the monster and begins to cut off pieces from the animal so as to feed himself. He is in the nourishing mother in the pre-sexual stage. His next act in order to free himself is to make a fire. In the myth of the Eskimos of the Bering Straits, the hero finds a woman in the whale's be belly. The soul of the animal, which is feminine, uh, end of it. The cave corresponds to the grave. The same idea is represented in the Christian mysteries, although generally in more beautiful human forms. The soul struggling of Christ in Gethsemane, where he struggles with himself in order to complete his work, where the transitus, the carrying of the cross, footnote, the carrying of the tree, played an important part, as, it, as, it, as is evident from a note in Strabo the Ten in the Cult of Dionysus in Ceres, Demeter, and footnote. So, where the Tresitus, the carrying of the cross, where he takes upon himself the symbol of destructive mother, and wherein takes himself to the sacrificial grave, from which, after three days, he triumphantly arises. All these ideas express the same fundamental thoughts. Also, the symbol of Eden is not lacking in the Christian mystery. Christ is a God who is eaten in, who is eaten in the Lord's Supper. 
His death transforms him into bread and wine, which we partake in a grateful memory of his great deed. Footnote. A text of the pyramids which treats the arrival of the dead pharaoh in heaven depicts how pharaoh takes possession of the gods in order to assimilate the divine nature and to become the lord of the gods. Quote, his servants have imprisoned the gods with a chain. They have taken them and dragged them away. They have bound them and have cut their throats and taken out their entrails. They have dismembered them and cooked them in their hot vessels, and the king consumed their forces and ate their souls. The great gods form his breakfast, the medium gods his dinner, the little gods his supper. The king, cons king consumes everything that comes his way. Greedily he devours everything, and his magic power becomes greater than all magic power. He becomes the heir of the, heir of the power, and he becomes greater than all heirs, and he becomes the Lord of heaven, and he eats all crowns and all bracelets, and he eats the wisdom of every god. Uh, end of quote. The impossible food, this bulimi, strikingly depicts the sexual libido in regression to the pre-sexual matter material, where the mother, the gods, is not the object of sex, but of hunger. End of footnote. So, where we were, his death transforms him into, a, into bread and wine, which we partake of in grateful memory of his great deed. And there was a footnote. So we go on. The relation of Agni to the Soma drink and that of Dionysus to wine must not be omitted here. Footnote to wine. Um, the sacramental sacrifice of Dionysus Zagrius and the eating of the sacrificial meat produced the Neos Dionysius, the resurrection of the god, as plainly appeared from the creation fragment of the Euripides quote in Dietrich. Agnon de Bayon Tainaun Aix U Deos Idaino Diaidaio Mustos Genomin Kai Nuxtipolu Zagrius Butas Taus Om Of Fagus Daitas Telesas, uh, and translated, living a blameless life, whereby I became an initiate of the Idean Zeus. I celebrated the carnivorous banquet of Zagreus, the wandering herdsman of the night. The mystic took the god themselves by eating the uncooked meat of the sacrificial animal. End of footnote. An evident parallel is Samson's rendering of the lion and the subsequent inhabitation of the dead lion by honeybees, which gives honeybees, which gives rise to the well-known German riddle. And here it says in German, it's the riddle, which I don't speak German, so I won't. I never studied it, so I'll just try the translation, which they don't give. Okay. Um, in the illusion mysteries, these thoughts seem to have played a role. Besides Demeter and Persephone, Aeacos is the chief god of the Elysian cult. He was the puer aeternus, the eternal boy, of whom Ovid says the following. Tu puer aeternus, tu formosimus alto, consperius coelo tibi, cum sine cornibus astas, virginum caput est. And so we'll translate this. Thou, boy eternal, thou most beautiful, one seen in the heavens without horns standing with thy virgin head, etc. In the great Elysian festival procession, the image of Iacos was carried. It is not easy to say which god Iacos is, possibly a boy or a newborn son, familiar to the Etrurian Tagis who bear the surname the fresh, freshly plowed boy, because, according to the myth, he arose from the furrow of the field behind the peasant who was plowing. This idea shows unmistakably the mondamin motive. The plow is of a well-known phallic meaning. The furrow of the field is personified by the Hindus as a woman. The psychology of this idea is that of, that of coyotus referring back to the pre-sexual stage, stage of nutrition. The sun is the edible fruit of the field. Aeacos passes in part as the son of Demeter and a, or of Persephone, also approximately as a consort of De, Demeter. Hero as a procreator of himself. He is also called Teis Dimnistros Daimon. Daimon equals libido, also mother libido. 
He was identified with Dionysus, especially with the Thracian Dionysus Sagrius, who, of whom a typical fate of rebirth was re related. Hera had goaded the Titans against Sagrius, who, assuming many forms, sought to escape them, until they finally took him what he had taken on then they finally took him when he took on the form of a bull. In this form he was killed, Mithras sacrificed, and dismembered, and the pieces were thrown into the cauldron. But Zeus killed the Titans by lightning and swallowed the still throbbing harp of Zagreus, and through this act he gave him existence once more, and Zagreus as Aeacos came again forth. Aeacos carried the torch, the phallic symbol of procreation, as Plato testifies. In the festival pro procession, the shelf sheath of corn, the cradle of Iacos was carried. Lic non mystica vanus Iaci. The Orphic legend relates that Iacos was brought up by Persephone when, after three years' slumber in the Lix non, a winnowing fan used as a cradle, he awoke. This statement distinctly suggests the Mondaemon motive. The 20th of Bordromian, the month Bordromian lasts from about the 5th of September to the 5th of October, is called Aeacos, in honor of the hero. On the evening of this day, the great torchlight procession took place on the seashore, in which the quest and lament of Demeter was represented. The role of Demeter, who, seeking her daughter, wanders over the whole earth without food or drink, has been taken over by Hiawatha in the Indian epic. He turns to all created things without obtaining an answer. As Demeter first learns of her daughter from the subterranean Hecate, so does Hiawatha first find the find first the one sought for, Mon Damon, in the deepest introversion, descent into the mother. Footnote to, to the Mon Damon. A close parallel to this is the Japanese myth of Izagni is I sorry Izanagi, who following his dead spouse into the underworld implored her return, to return. She is ready, but beseeches him, do not look at me. Izagnagi produces light with his reed, that is to say, with a masculine piece of wood, the fire boring a phallus, and thus loses his spouse. Mother must be put in the place of spouse. Instead of the mother, the hero produces fire, Hiawatha maize, Odin runes, when he is tormented, and when he in torment hung on the tree. End of footnote. So, Hiawatha produces from himself Mondaemon as a mother produces the son. The longing for the mother also includes producing mother, fire devouring, then birth giving. Concerning great contents of the mysteries, we learn through the testimony of Bishop um, Astrius about 390 AD the following quote Is not there in Eleusis the gloomiest descent? and the most solemn communion of the Hierophant and the priestess between him and her alone? Are the torches not extinguished, and does not the vast multitude regard as their salvation that which takes place between the two in the darkness? End of quote. That points undoubtedly to a ritual marriage, which was celebrated subterraneously in Mother Earth. The priestess of Demeter seems to be a representative of the Earth goddess, perhaps the pharaoh, the field. Footnote. A son lover from the Demeter myth is Aeacion, who embraces Demeter upon a thrice plowed cornfield, bridal couch in the pasture. For that, Aeacion was struck by lightning by Zeus in Ovid Metamorphosis uh, 9. So, end of it. The descent into the earth is also the symbol of the mother's womb and was a widespread conception under the form of a cave worship. Plutarch related of the magi that they were sacrificed to Ariman, Aistopon, Anilion, descent into the sunless desert place. Luctian lets the magician Mithrobarazanis, Aisxarion, Epimon, Kai Uludes, Kai Analion, translated. Sorry, the other one was in a sunless place. This one is descent into the sunless desert. So, so they were sacrificed. The magi was sacri talked about sacrifice in a sunless place, and now Lucian is the magi magician is descended into a sunless desert place. So, 
So he descends into the bowels of the earth. According to the testimony of Moses of the Koran, the sister of fire and the brother of spring were worshipped in an Armenian cave. Julian gave an account from the Addis legend of Katabasis Ais Anthro, Anthron, um, descent into a cave, from whence a symbol brings up her son lover, that is to say, gives birth to him. The cave of Christ's birth in Bethlehem, house of bread, is said to have been at Attis Speleum. A further Elysian symbol is found in the festival of, of Hierogamos in the form of the mystic chests, which, according to the testimony of Clemens of Alexandria, may have contained pastry, salt, and fruits. The Synthema confession of the mystic transmitted by Clemens is suggestive in still another direction. Quote, I have fasted, I have drank of the barley drink, I have taken from the chest, and after I have labored, I have placed it back in the basket, and from the basket into the chest. The question as to what lay in the chest is explained in detail by Dietrich. The labor he considers a phallic activity, which the mystic has, has to perform. In fact, representations of the mystic blanket are given wherein lies a phallus surrounded by fruits. Footnote, for example, a campana relief in Lovatili. Likewise, the Venetian Priapus has a basket filled with phalli. And footnote. Upon the so-called Lovali tomb vase, the sculptors of which are understood to be Elysian ceremonies, it is shown how a mystic caressed the serpent entwining Demeter. The caressing of the fear animal indicates a religious conquering of uh, incest. Footnote. Compare Grimm. Either by the caressing or kissing of a dragon or a snake, the fearful animal was changed into a beautiful woman whom the hero wins in this, in this way. And the footnote. According to the testimony of Clemens of Alexandria, a serpent was in the chest. The serpent in this connection is naturally of phallic nature, the phallus, which is forbidden in relation to the mother. Rodi mentions that in the Arhitophoris, pastry in the form of phalli and serpents, were thrown into the cave. These were thrown into the cave near um, Thesmophorion. This custom was a petition for the bestowal of children and the harvest. Footnote. The mother, the earth, is the distributor of nourishment. The mother is presexual material. In presexual material has this meaning. Therefore, St. Dominicus was nourished from the breasts of the mother of God. The sun wife and the maqua consists of bacon. Compare with this the megalomaniac ideas of my patient who asserted, I am Germania and Helvatica made exclusively from sweet butter. And a footnote. So, according to the, let's see, I'll be back to the where we were. Yes, the snake also plays a large part in the initiations under the remarkable title of O Dai Kol Pau Theos. He who achieves divinity through the womb. Clemens observed that the symbol of the Sabzios mysteries is O Dai Kol Pau Theos, Dravaxon de Esti Kai Utos Dailxminos Tau Kolpau Tau Teluminon. And so we translate that. He who achieved divinity through the moon, he is a serpent, and he was drawn through the womb of those who were being initiated. Through Arbneus we learn, Aureus Colomber in sinem dimititur consecratus et ex minitur rursus ab inforibus partibus atque imus. And so we translate this. The golden serpent is crowned into the breast of the initiates and is then drawn out through the lowest parts. End of translation. In the Orphic Hymn 52, Bacchus is invoked by Upokolepe Othetis, he who is the vagina of womb, which indicates that the god enters into man as though uh, through, as if through the female genitals. Footnote. Compare the idea of Nietzsche piercing into one's own pit, etc. 
etc., in a prayer to Hermes in the London papyrus, it is said, Erote moi cure erme aus ta um, briefe ais tas uh, coelias tau gunaixon. Come to me, Lord Hermes, in the fetus of the womb of the mother. End of footnote. According to the testimony of Hippolytus, the hierophant in the mystery exclaimed, I pu etiki potai zorpon brima brimon. The revered, the revered, the revered one has brought forth a holy boy, bremos from brimo. This Christmas, Christmas gospel, unto us is born a son, is illustrated especially through the tradition that the Athenians secretly showed to the partakers of e Epopia, the great and wonderful and most perfect epopic mystery, a mown stalk of wheat. So footnote, the typical green god of antiquity was Adonis, whose death and resurrection was celebrated annually. He was the sun lover of the mother, for the grain is the sun and fructifier of the womb of the earth, as Robertson very correctly remarks. End of footnote. The parallel for the motive of death and resurrection is the motive of losing and finding. The motive appears in religious rites in exactly the same connection, namely in spring festivities similar to Hierogamos, where the image of the god was hidden and found again. It is an uncanonical tradition that Moses left his father's house when 12 years old to teach mankind. In a similar manner, Christ is lost by his parents, and then they find him again as a teacher of wisdom, just as in the Mohammedan legend, Moses and Joshua lose the fish and in his place sheathes her, and the teaching of wisdom appears. Like the boy Jesus in the temple. So does the corn god, lost and believed to be dead, suddenly arise again from his suggestive thought of fodder. Robertson therefore places the manger as a parallel of the lichnon. We understand from these accounts why the Elysian mysteries were for the mystic, so rich in comfort for the hope of a better world, a beautiful illusion epithet shows that, shows this, unquote. Truly, a beautiful secret is proclaimed by the blessed gods. Mortality is not a curse, but death a blessing. And the, end, the hymn of Demeter in the mysteries also says the same, quote, Blessed is he, the earthborn man, who hath seen this, who hath not shared in these divine sh ceremonies. He hath an unequal fate in the obscure darkness of death. Immortality is inherent in the Elysian symbol. In a church song of the 19th century by Samuel Priestwork, we discover it again, quote, The world is yours, Lord Jesus, the world is on which we stand, because it, is, because it is thy world, it cannot perish. Only the wheat, before it comes up to the light in its fertility, must die in the bosom of the earth, first freed from its own nature. Thou goest, O Lord, our chief, to heaven through thy sorrows, and guide him who believes in thee on the same path. Then take us all equally to share in thy sorrows and kingdoms. Guide us through thy gate of death, bring thy world into the light. Formicus relates concerning the Attic mysteries. Nocte quandam simul simula, oh, sorry, simulacrum in lectita supinum ponitur et Per numeros digestis flitibus plagitur. Dendicam sifica lamentionti satia verint. Lumen infertur. Toc a sacte dote omnium qui flebant facus on guentur. Quidus per uctis sac. I'm sorry. Sacredus hoc lento mumro serant. Um, Thapaite mustai tau theo. Sesau men nu. Estai gar imen ec puto. Satteria. So translated. On a certain night, an image is placed lying down in the litter. There is weeping and lamentation among the people. 
with beatings of bones and tears. After a time, when they have become exhausted from the lamentations, a light appears. Then the priest announce, anoints the throne of those who are weeping and softly whispers, Take courage, initiates of the redeemed divinity. You shall achieve salvation through your grief. End. Such parallels show how little human personality and how much divine, that is to say, universally human, is found in the Christ mystery. No man is, or indeed ever was, a hero, for the hero is a god, and therefore impersonal and generally applicable to all. Christ is a spirit, quote-unquote spirit, as if shown in the very early Christian in, in interpretation. In, a different, in different places of the earth, and in the most varied forms and in the coloring of the various periods, the savior hero appears as a fruit of the entrance of the libido into the personal maternal depths. The Bacchaean consecrations represented upon the Farnes relief contain a scene where a mystic wrapped in a mantle drawn over his head was laid to Sealand, which holds the Lignon chalice covered with a cloth. The covering of the head signifies death. The mystic dies figuratively, like the seed of corn, grows again and comes to the corn harvest. Procleus relates that the mystics were buried up to their necks. The Christian church as a place of religious ceremony is really nothing but the grave of a hero, catacombs. The believer descends into the grave in order to rise from the dead with a hero. That the meaning underlying the church is that of the mother's womb can scarcely be doubted. The symbols of Mass are so distinct that the mythology of the sacred act peeps out everywhere. It is the magic charm of rebirth. The veneration of the holy sepulchre is most plain in this respect. The striping striking example is this of the, in the Holy Sepulchre is the St. Um, Stefano in Bologna. The church itself, a very old polygonal, poly, polygonal building, consists of the remains of a temple to Isis. The interior contains an artificial spalium, a so-called Holy Sepulchre, into which one creeps through a very near little door. After a long sojourn, the believer reappears, reborn into the mother's womb. An Etruscan osorium in the Archaeological Museum of, in Florence is at the same time a statue of Matuta, the goddess of death. The clay figure of the goddess is hallowed within as a receptacle for the ashes. The representations indicated that Matuta is the mother. Her chair is adorned with sphinxes as a fitting symbol for the mother of death. Only a few of the further deeds of Hiawatha can interest us here. Among these is the battle with Mishninama, the fish king, in the eighth song. This deserves to be mentioned as a typical battle of a sun hero. Mishninamana is a fish monster who dwells at the bottom of the waters. Challenged by Hiawatha to battle, he devours the hero together with his boat. Quote, in his wrath, he darted upward, flashing, leaped into the sunshine, opened his great jaws, and swallowed both canoe and Hiawatha. Dro down into the darksome cavern, plunged the headlong Hiawatha, as a log on some black river shoots and plunges down the rapids, found himself in utter darkness, groped about in helpless wonder, till he felt a great heart beating, throbbing in that utter darkness, and he smote it with his anger. With his fist, the heart of Namha felt the mighty king of fishes shudder through each nerve and fiber. Crosswise then did Hiawatha drag his birch canoe for safety, lest from out the jaws of Nama, in the turmoil and confusion, forth he might be hurled and perish. It is the typical myth of the work of the hero distributed over the entire world. He takes to a boat, fights with the sea monster, is devoured, he defends himself against being bitten or crushed. Footnote Faust. There whirls the press like clouds on clouds unfolding, then with stretched arms swing high the key without holding. Um, so he defends himself against being bitten or crushed, resistance or stamping motive. Having arrived in the interior of the whale dragon, he seeks the vital organ which he cuts off or in some way destroys. Often the death of the monster occurs as a result of a fire which the hero secretly makes within him. He mysteriously creates the womb of death itself, the rise of the sun. So there's a picture in here of Matuta and Etruscan Pieta, and it's um, the mother goddess holding a, an infant, and her throne has got and served two lions, two women. Um, she's got braids, a braid crown. So we go on. The bird, in this sense, probably means the rescent 
re reessence of the sun, the longing of the libido, the rebirth of the phoenix. The longing is very frequently represented by the symbol of hovering. The sun symbol. Oops, I missed a footnote. Okay. So the hero again attains the light of day. So now we're to the footnote. So as an example among many, I mention here the Polynesian Rata myth cited by Frobenius. Quote, with a favorable wind, the boat was sailing easily away over the ocean. When Nagan Nao called out one day, Oh, Rada, here is a fearful enemy which rises up from the ocean. It was an open muscle of huge dimensions. One shell was in front of the boat, the other behind it, and the vessel was directly between. The next moment, the horrible muscle would have clapped its shell together and ground the boat and occupants into pieces in its grip. But Nagan but Naganeoa was prepared for the possibility. He grasped his long spear and quickly plunged it into the belly of the animal so that the creature, instead of snapping together, at once sank back to the bottom of the sea. After they had escaped from this danger, they continued on their way. But after a while, the voice of always watchful Naganeoa was again to be heard. Oh, Rata, once more a terrible enemy rushes upwards from the depths of the ocean. This time it was a mighty octopus whose gigantic tentacles were surrounding the boat. In order to destroy it, at the critical moment, Naganawa seized a spear and plunged it into the head of the octopus. The tentacle sank limp, and the dead monster rose to the surface of the water. Once more, they continued on their journey, and yet a great danger awaited them. One day, a valiant Naga Nagawada called out, Orata, here is a great whale! The huge jaws were wide open. The lower jaw was already under the boat, and the upper one over it, and one moment more, and the whale would have devoured them. Now, Nagawa, the dragon slayer, broke his spear into two parts, and at the moment when the whale was about to devour them, he stuck the two pieces into the jaws of the foe so that he could not close his jaws. Naganoa quickly sprang into the jaws of the great whale, devouring the hero, and looked into its belly. And what did he see? There sat both his parents, his father, Tairitor and his mother, Vayaroa, who had been gulped down into the depths of the monster. The oracle had come true. The voyage had come to an end. Great was the joy of the parents of Naganawa when they saw their son. They were convinced that their freedom was at hand, and Naganawa resolved upon revenge. He took one of the two pieces from the jaw of the animal. One was enough to make it impossible for the whale to close his jaws and so keep passage free for Nagawa and his parents. He broke this part of the spear into two, and in order to use them as wood to produce fire for rubbing, he commanded his father to hold one below him. And he threw it, and, and while he himself managed with the upper one, until the fire began to glimmer, production of the fire. Now when he blew into the flames, he hastened to heat the, the fatty part, the heart of the belly, with a fire. The monster, writhing with pain, sought help, swimming to the nearest land, journey to sea, and as soon as he reached the sandbank land, father, mother, and son walked out onto the land through the open jaw of the dying whale, slipping out of the hero. So there, there's the footnote to um, the... So the hero again attains the light of day. So we'll go on. The bird in this sense probably means the rescence of the sun, the reascence of the sun, the longing of the libido, the rebirth of the phoenix. The longing is very frequently represented by the symbol of hovering. The sun symbol of the bird rising from the waters is etymologically con contained in the singing swan. Swan is derived from the roots sven, like sun and tone, see the proceeding. This act signifies rebirth and the bringing forth of life from the mother. Footnote. In the New Zealand Maori myth, quoted by Frobenius, the monster to be conquered is the grandmother Hinu Nui Tipo, Maui, the hero, says to the birds who assist him, My little friends, now when I creep into the jaws of the old woman, you must not laugh, but when I have been in and come out again from her mouth, then you may greet me with jubilant laughter. Then Maui actually creeps into the mouth of the sleeping old woman. End footnote. So, and by this means the ultimate destruction of death, which according to a Negro myth has come into the world through the mistake of an old woman who at the time of a general casting of skins, for men renewed their youth through castings of their skins like snake, drew on through absent-mindedness her own skin instead of her new one, and as a result died. But the effect of such an act could not be of any duration. Again and again troubles of the hero are renewed and always under the symbol of deliverance from the mother. Just as Hera, after as the pursuing mother, is the real source of the great deeds of Hercules, so does Nokomus allow Hiawatha no rest, rises up new difficulties in his path in the form of desperate adventures in which the hero may perhaps conquer, but also perhaps may perish. 
The libido of mankind is always in advance of his consciousness. Unless his libido calls him forth to new dangers, he sinks into slothful inactivity, or on the other hand, childish longing for the mother overcomes him at the summit of his existence, and he allows himself to become pitifully weak instead of striving with desperate courage towards the highest. The mother becomes the demon, who summons the hero to adventure, and who also places in his path the poisonous serpent, which will strike him. Nokomis, in the ninth song, calls Hiawatha, points with her hands to the west, where the sun sets in purple splendor, and says to him, quote, Yonder dwells the great Pearl Father, Megisogwen the magician, Manito of wealth and wampum, guarded by his fiery serpents, guided by the black pitch water. You can see his fiery serpents, the Kina beak, the great serpents coiling, playing in the water. End quote. This danger lurking in the west is known to mean death, which no one, even the mightiest, may escape. This magician, as we learned, also killed the father of Nokomis. Now she sends her son forth to avenge the father of Horus. Through the symbols attributed to the magician, it may easily be recognized that he symbol what he symbolizes. Snake and water belong to the mother, the snake as a symbol of repressed longing for the mother, or in other words, as a symbol of resistance, encircles protectingly and defensively the maternal rock, inhibits the cave, winds itself upwards around the mother tree, and guards the precious ward the mysterious treasure. The black Stygian water is like the black muddy spring of Duguernian, the place where the sun dies and enters into rebirth, the maternal sea of death and night. On his journey thither, Hiawatha takes with him the magic oil of Mishinama, which helps his boat through the waters of death, also a sort of charm for immortality, like the dragon's blood for Siegfried, etc. First, Hiawatha slays the great serpent, of the night journey in the sea, over the Stygian waters, it is written, quote, All night long he sailed upon it, sailed upon the sluggish water, covered with its mounds of ages, black and rotting water rushes, rank with flags and leaves and livies, stagnant, lifeless, dreary, dismal, lightened by the shimmering moonlight, and by willow-wisps illumined, fires by ghosts of dead men kindled in the weary night encampments. End quote. The description plainly shows the character of a water death. This content, the contents of the water point to an already mentioned motive, that of encoiling and devouring. It is said in the Key to Dreams of Jagdeva, published and prepared by Julius V. Niglian. Anyway, says, Whoever in dreams surrounds her, but his body with bast, creepers or ropes, with snake skin, threads, or tissues, dies. I refer to the preceding arguments in regarding this, having come into the Westland, the hero challenges the magician to battle. A terrible struggle begins. Hiawatha is perilous because Meg Sogwon is invulnerable. At evening, Hiawatha retires, wounded, despairing for a while, in order to rest. Quote. Pause to rest beneath the pine trees, from whose branches trailed the mosses, and whose trunk was coated over with the dead men's moccasin leather with the fungus white and yellow.
This protecting tree is described as coated over with the moccasin leather of the dead, the fungus. This investing of the tree with anthropomorphic attributes is also an important rite wherever tree worship prevails, as for example in India where each village has its sacred tree, which is clothed and in general treated as a human being. The trees are anointed with fragrant waters, sprinkled with powder, adorned with garlands and draperies. Just as among people, the piercing of the ears was performed as an apotropiac charm against death, so does it occur with the holy tree. All of the trees of India's of all of the trees of India, there is none more sacred than, to the Hindus than the Aswatha, Fecus religiosa. It is known to them as uh, Vriksha Raga, Raja, the king of trees. Brahman, Vishnu, and Mahivsvar live in it, and the worship of it is the worship of the triad. Almost every Indian village has an Aswatha, etc. This village linden tree, well known to us, is here clearly characterized as the mother symbol. It contains the three gods. Hence, when Hiawatha retires to rest under the pine tree, pine tree footnote, the pine tree speaks the significant word, miniwawa, and footnote, it is a dangerous step because he resigns himself to the mother, whose garment is the garment of the dead, the devouring mother. As in the whale dragon, the hero also, in this situation, needs a helpful bird, that is to say, the helpful animals, which represent benevolent parents. Quote, Suddenly from the boughs above him sang the mama, the woodpecker, Aim your arrows, Hiawatha, at the head of Migisoguan. Strike the tuft of hair upon it. At their roots, the long black trestles, there alone can he be wounded. End quote. Now, amusing to relate, Mama hurried to his help. It is a particular fact that the woodpecker was also the mama of Romulus and Remus, who put nourishment into the mouths of the twins with his beak. A footnote. In, the, in a fairy tale, the bird comes to the tree which grows upon the grave of the mother in order to give help. End footnote. Compare with the role of the vulture in Leonard, Leonardo's dream. The vulture is sacred to Mars, like the woodpecker. With the paternal significance of the woodpecker, the ancient Italian folk superstition agrees that from the tree upon which this bird nested, any nail which has been driven in will soon drop out again. The woodpecker owes its special significance to the circumstances that he hammers holes into trees, quote, to drive nails in as above. It is therefore understandable that he has made much of he has was made much of in the Roman legend as an old king of the country or possessor of the ruler of the holy tree, the primitive image of the pater familias. An old fable relates how Circe, spouse of King Picus, transformed himself in, transformed him sorry transformed him into Picus Maricius, the woodpecker. The sorceress is the new creating mother who has a magic influence upon the sun husband. She kills him, transforms into the soul bird, the unfulfilled wish. Picus was also understood as the wood demon and incubus, as well as the soothsayer, all of which fully indicated the mother libido. Footnote. The father of Picus is called Sterculus or Sterculius, a name which is clearly derived from Stricus equals excrementum. He is also said to be the divisor of manure. This primitive creature who was also created who also created the mother did so in the manner of infantile creation, which we have previously learned. The supreme god laid an egg, his mother, from which he was again produced. This is an analogous train of thought. And a footnote. Picus was often placed on par with Pica Munus by the ancients. Pica Munus is the inseparable companion of Pila Munus, and both are actually called Infanti Dei, the gods of little children. Especially it is said of Pila Munus that he defended newborn children against the destroying attacks of the wood demon, Sylvanus, good and bad mother, the motive of the two mothers. The benevolent bird a wish thought of deliverance which arrives from introversion footnote introversion is to enter the mother to sink into one's own inner world or source of the libido is symbolized by creeping in passing through boring scratching behind the ear equals making fire boring into the ear scratching with the nails swallowing serpents thus the buddhist legend is understandable when guatama spends the whole day sitting in deep reflection under the sacred tree at evening he becomes buddha the illuminated one 
and offended. So, I'll start the sentence again. The benevolent bird, a wish thought of deliverance, which ar arises from introversion, and we have the effort not there, ar arises the hero to shoot the magician under the hair, which is the only vulnerable spot. This spot is the phallic point. Compare phallus, footnotes, compare phallus above and its etymological connection, and footnote. If one may venture to say so, it is at the top of the head, at the place where the mystic birth from the sacred head takes place, which even today appears in children's sexual theories. Into that Hiawatha shoots, one may say very naturally, three arrows, the well-known phallic symbol, and thus kills Megisogawan. Thereupon he steals the magic wampum, wampum armor, which renders him invulnerable, means of immortality. He significantly leaves the dead lying in the water because the magician is the fearful mother. Quote, on the shore he left the body half on land and half in water. In the sand his feet were buried, in his face was in the, and his face was in the water. End quote. Thus the situation is the same as with the fish king, because the monster is a personification of the water of death, which in its turn represents the devouring mother. The great dead of Hiawatha is where he has vanquished the mother as the death-bringing demon, footnote, to death-bringing demon, in the form of the father, for Megisowan is the demon of the West, like um, Mujikiwis. So, um, is followed by, the mar by marriage with Minihaha. So I missed a footnote, which is when he, they talk about into the, Hiaw the Hiawatha shoots, what might say very naturally, three arrows. So there's a footnote to three arrows, which I'll go back and read. Spielman's patient received from God three wounds through her head, breast, and eye. Then there came a resurrection with the spirit, quote-unquote. In the Tibetan myth, myth Bogdai Geser Khan, the sun hero, shoots his arrow into the forehead of the demonical old woman, who devours it and spits it up again. In the Kalmuk, Kalmuk myth, the hero shoots the arrow into the eye of the emitting rays, which is found on the forehead of the bull. Compare with that the victory of Polyphemus, whose character is is signified upon an attic vase, because with it there was also a snake, a symbol of the mother. See an explanation of the Sacrificium Myth Mithraciam. Okay, so that's the end of the footnote about the three arrows, and then we're going to go back to where we were. So we'll start at this beginning of the sentence. This great deed of Hiawatha's, where he has had, had has vanished the mother of the death-bringing demon, is followed by his marriage with Minihaha. A little fable which the poet has inserted into the latter song is noteworthy. An old man is transformed by a youth by crawling through a hollow old tree. In the fourth song, is a description of how Hiawatha discovers writing. I limit myself, myself to the description of two hieroglyphic tokens. Quote, Ginshi Manito the Mighty, he, the master of life, was painting as an egg which points projecting to the four winds of heaven. Everywhere is the, God, is the great spirit, was the meaning of this symbol. End quote. The world lies in the egg which encompasses at every point. It is the cosmic woman with child, the symbol of which Plato, as well as the Vedas, has made use of. The mother is like the air, which is everywhere, but air is spirit. The mother of the world is spirit. Quote, Michi Manhito, the mighty, he was he the dreadful spirit of evil, as a serpent was depicted as Kinabik, the great serpent. End quote. But the spirit of evil is fear, is the forbidden desire, the adversary who, pose, who opposes not only each individual heroic deed, but life in its struggles for eternal duration as well, and who introduces into our body the poison of weakness and age through the treacherous spite of the serpent. It is all that is retrogressive, as, and as the model of our first world is our mother, all retrogressive tendencies are towards the mother, and therefore are disguised under the incest image. In both the ideas, these ideas, the poet has represented in mythologic symbols the libido arising from the mother and the libido striving backwards towards the mother. There, it is, there is a description in the 15th song how Chibiadbos, Hiawatha's best friend, the amiable player and singer, the embodiment of joy of life, was enticed by the evil spirit into the ambush, fell through the ice, and was drowned. 
Hiawatha mourns for him so long as he succeeds with the aim of the magician in calling him back again. But the revived friend is only a spirit, and he becomes master of the land of spirits. Osiris, lord of the underworld, the two Dioscursi. Battles again follow, and then comes the loss of the second friend, Kwa Sind, the embodiment of physical strength. In the twentieth song, a curfamine and the death of Minihaha are told by two taciturn guests from the land of death, and in the twenty-second song, Hiawatha present, prepares for the final journey to the Westland. Quote, I am going, O Nokomis, on a long and distant journey to the portrait of the sunset, to the regions of the homeland, to the northwest Kini Kiwaiden, one long track and trail of splendor down whose stream is down a river westward, westward Hiawatha, sailed into the fiery sunset, sailed into the fi purple vapors, sailed into the dusk of evening. Thus departed Hiawatha, Hiawatha the Beloved, in the glory of the sunset, in the purple mist of evening, and to the regions of the homeland of the northwest wind, Kiwaiden, to the islands of the blessed, to the kingdom, kingdom of Ponima, to the land of the hereafter. End quote. The sun, victoriously arising, tears itself away from the embrace and clasp from the enveloping womb of the sea and sinks again into the maternal sea, into night, the all enveloping and the all reproducing, leaving behind it the heights of midday and all its glorious works. This image was the first and most profoundly entitled to become the symbolic carrier of human destiny. In the morning, in the morning of life, people painfully tear, man painfully tears himself loose from the mother, from the domestic hearth, to rise through battle to his heights not seeing his worst enemy in front of him, but bearing him within himself a deadly longing for the depths within, for drowning in his own source, for becoming absorbed into the mother. His life in a constant struggle with death, a violent and transitory delivery from the always lurking night. The death is no external enemy, but a deep personal longing for quiet and for the profound peace of non-existence, for a dreamless sleep in the ebb and flow of the sea of life even in his highest endeavor for harmony and equilibrium, for philosophic depths and artistic enthusiasm, he seeks death, immobility, satiety, and rest. If, like Pyrethrus, he tarries too long in this place of rest and peace, he is overcome by torpidity, and the poison of the serpent paralyzes him for all time. If he, is to, if he is to live, he must fight and sacrifice his longing for the past in order to rest to, his, to rise to his own heights. And having reached the noonday heights, he must also sacrifice the love for his own achievement, for he may not loiter. The sun also sacrifices its greatest strengths in order to hasten onwards to the fruits of autumn, which are the seeds of immortality, filled in, fulfilled in child and children, in works and posthumous fame, in a new order of things, all of which in their turn begin and complete the sun's course over again. The Song of Hiawatha contains, on these exact show, a material which is very well adapted to bring into play the abundance of ancient symbolic possibilities latent in the human mind and to stimulate it to the creation of mythologic figures. But the products always contain the same old problems of humanity, which rise again and again in new symbolic disguise from the shadowy world of the unconscious. Thus, Miss Miller is reminded through the longing of Chiwantopel of another mystic cycle which appeared in the form of Wagner's Siegfried. Especially is this shown in the passage of Chiwantopel's monologue where he exclaims, quote, There is no one who understands me, not one who resembles me, not one who has a soul sister to mine, end quote. Miss Miller observes that the sentiment of this passage has the greatest analogy with the feelings which Siegfried experienced for Brunhilde. This analogy causes us to cast our glance at the song of Siegfried, especially at the re relation of Siegfried and Brunhilde. It is a well-recognized fact that Brunhilde, the v Valkyrie, gives protection to the birth ancestress of Siegfried, while Sieg Siegland is the human mother, Brunhilde is the role of the spiritual mother, Mother Imago. However, unlike Hera towards Hercules, she is not a, a pursuer, but benevolent. This sin, in which she is an accomplice, by means of the help she renders, is the reason for her banishment by Wotan. 
The strange birth of Siegfried from the sister wife disguises, distinguishes him as Horus, as the reborn son, the reincarnation of the retreating Osiris, Wotan. Oh, sorry, Os, Osiris. The birth of the young son of the hero results indeed from mankind, who, however, are merely the human bearers of the cosmic symbolism. Thus the birth is protected by the spirit mother, Hera Lilith. She sends Se Siglind with the child in her room, Mary's flight, on the night journey on the sea to the east. Quote, Onward hasten, turn to the east, O woman thou cherishest, thou sublimest hero of the world, thy, shielding, sh thy sheltering womb. End quote. The motive of dismemberment is found again in the broken sword of Sigmund, which was kept for Siegfried. From the dismemberment, life is pierced through again, the Medea wonder. Just as the smith forges the pieces together, so it is dismembered, dead again and put together. This comparison is also found in the Timaeus of Plato, the parts of the world joined together with pegs. In the Rig Veda 1072, the creator of the world, Brahma, Na Pati is a smith. Quote, Brahma Na Pati is a blacksmith weld the world together. End quote. The sword has a significance of a phallic sun power. Therefore, a sword protects from the mouth of the apocalyptic Christ, that is to say, the procreative fire, the word, or the procreative logos. In Rig Vida, Brahma Na Pati is also the pr a prayer world word which possessed an ancient creative significance. Um, quote, and this prayer of the singers expanding from itself became a cow, which was already there before the world, dwelling together in the womb of this god, foster children of the same keeper are the gods. Rig Veda 1031. The Logos became a cow, that is to say, the mother, who was pregnant with the gods. In Christian uncanonical, uncanonical fantasies where the Holy Ghost has feminine significance, we have the well-known motive of the two mothers, the earthy mother Mary and the spiritual mother, the Holy Ghost. The transformation of the Logos into the mother is not remarkable in itself, because the origin of the phenomenon fire speech seems to be the mother of libido, according to the discussion in the earlier chapter. The spiritual is the mother libido. The significance of the sword in the Sanskrit conception kishas is probably partly determined by its sharpness, as is shown above, in its, in its connection with the libido conception. The motive of pursuit, the pursuing sig lind, the analogous to lito, is not here bound up with the spiritual model, mother, but with wotan, therefore corresponding to the limos, linos legend, where the father of the wife is also the pursuer. Wotan is also the father of Brunhilde. Brunhilde stands in a particular relation to Wotan. Brunhilde says to Wotan, quote, Thou speakest to the will of Wotan by telling me what, that, what thou wishest. Who am I? Were not I thy will, Wotan? I take counsel only with myself when I speak with thee. And Brunhilde is also something, somewhat the angel of, of the face, that creative word, will or wor word, and then here a uh, footnote. An analogy is Zeus and Athene. In Rig Veda 1031, the word of prayer becomes a pregnant cow. In Persian, it is the eye of Ahrua, Babylonian Nub N Nabu, the word of fate. Persian, Wohu Mano, a good thought of the creator of God, the, uh, the a good thought of the creator God. In Stoic conceptions, Hermes is Logos, or word intellect. In Alexandria, Sophia in the Old Testament is the angel Jeho Jehovah, or the countenance of God. Jacob wrestles with the angel during the night at the ford of Jabbok, where he had crossed the water with all he possessed, that he possessed. Night journey on the sea, battle with a night snake, combat at the ford like Hiawatha. In this combat, Jacob dislocated his thigh, motive of the twisting out of the arm, castration on account of the overpowering of the mother. This face of God was compared in the old Jewish philosophy to the mystic Metraton, the prince of the face of the god, Josiah 5.14, who brings the prayer of God and in whom is the name of God. The Nasins, of its called the Holy Ghost, the first word, the mother of all that lives, 
The Valentinians comprehended the descending dove of Pneuma as the word of the mother from above, the Sophia. Um, in Assyrian Jibel, the first god had the role of Logos. In Ephraim, the Syrian writer of hymns, John the Baptist said to Christ, quote, A spark of fire in the air awaits for thee over the Jordan. If thou followest and wilt be baptized, then take possession of thyself and wash thyself. For who has the power to take hold of burning fire with his hands? Thou who art holy fire, have mercy upon me. End quote. And a footnote. So we'll come back. Brun, we'll start again the sentence. Brunhild is also somewhat the angel of that of the face, that creative will or word, I had that footnote, emanating from God, also the logos, which became the child bearing woman. God created the world through his word, that is to say, his mother, the woman who is to bring him forth again, he lays his own egg. This peculiar conception, it seems to me, can be explained by assuming the libido overflowing with, into speech, thought, has preserved its sexual character to an extraordinary degree as a result of the initial inertia. In this way, the word had to execute and fulfill, fulfill all that was denied to the sexual wish, namely the return into the mother in order to attain eternal duration. The word fulfills this wish by itself becoming the daughter, the wife, the mother of God, who brings him forth anew. Footnote. Perhaps the great significance of the name arose from this fantasy. End footnote. Wagner has this idea vaguely in his mind in Wotan's Lament over Brunhilde. Quote, none as she knew my inmost thoughts, none knew the source of my will as she, she herself was the creating womb of my wish, and so now she has broken the blessed union. End quote. Brunhilde's sin is the favoring of Sigmund, but behind this lies incest. This is projected into the brother-sister relation of Sigmund and Siglind. In reality, and archaically expressed, Wotan, the father, has entered into his self-created daughter in order to rejuvenate himself. But this must, of course, be veiled. Wotan is rightly indignant with Brunhild, for she has taken the Isis role, and through the birth of the sun has deprived the man of his power. The first attack of the death serpent in the form of the sun, Sigmund, Wotan has repelled. He has broken Sigmund's sword, but Sigmund arises again in a grandson. This inevitable fate is always helped by the woman, hence the wrath of Wotan. At Siegfried's birth, Sieglind dies as is proper. The foster mother, so footnote, Grimm mentions the legend that Siegfried was suckled by a doe. So the foster mother is apparently not a woman, but a Catholic god, a crippled dwarf, who belongs to the tribe which renounces love. Footnote. Compare Grimm's mythology. Mim or Mimir is a gigantic being of great wisdom, a very old nature god, with whom the Norse gods associate. Later fables make of him a demon and a skillful smith, closest relation to Wyland. Just as Wotan obtained advice from the wise woman, compare the quotation from Julius Caesar about the German matron, so does Odin go to the brook of Mimir, in which wisdom and judgment lie hidden to the spiritual mother, mother image. There he requests a drink, drink of immortality, but no sooner does he receive it than he sacrifices his eye to the well, death of the sun in the sea. The well of Mimir points undoubtedly to the mother significance of Mimir. Thus Mimir gets possession of Odin's other eye. In Mimir, the mother, wise giant, in the embryo, dwarf, subterranean, sun, hip, harpocrates, is condensed, likewise as mother. He is the source of wisdom and art, mother imago, therefore, therefore may be translated as fantasy under certain circumstances. End of that footnote. The Egyptian god of the underworld, the crippled shadow of Osiris, who celebrated a melancholy resurrection in the sexless semi-ape Hippocrates, is the tutor of Horus, who has to avenge the death of his father. Meanwhile, Brunhild sleeps the enchanted sleep, like a hierogamos upon a mountain where Wotan has put her to sleep. Footnote. The magic sleep is also present in the Homeric cel cel celebration of the hierogamos. End footnote. Where Wotan put her to sleep with the magic thorn, Edda, surrounded by the flames of Wotan's fire, equal to libido, 66. Oh, sorry. Footnote. This is proven by Siegfried, Siegfried's words. Quote. Through the furious fire to thee have I fared, nor briny nor buckler guarded 
to my, my breast, the, frame, the flames have broken through to my heart. My blood doth bound in turbulent streams, a ravaging fire within me is kindled. End of footnote. So that was equal to libido, and then we had that footnote, which wards off everyone. But Meme becomes Siegfried's enemy and wills his death through Fafner. Here, Meme's dynamic nature is revealed. He is a masculine representation of the Terrible Mother, also a foster mother of demonic nature, who places the poisonous worm, Typhon, in her son, Horus's path. Siegfried, Siegfried's longing for the mother drives him away from Meme, and he travel, his travel... His travel begins with the mother of death and leads through vanquishing the terrible mother. A footnote on terrible mother. The cave dragon is the terrible mother. In the German legend, the maiden to be rescued often appears as a snake or a dragon and must be kissed in this form, though through which the dragon is changed into a beautiful woman. A fish or a serpent's tail is attributed to certain wise women. In the Golden Mountain, a king's daughter was bewitched into a snake. In the Oselberg near Dikelberl, there lived a snake with a woman's head and a bunch of keys around her neck and grim. So the terrible mother, that's in the footnote to the woman, Siegfried, off with the imp, I never would see him more, might I but know what my mother was like, that will my thought never tell me, her eyes tender light, surely do did shine like the soft eyes of the doe, end quote. Siegfried decides to separate from the demon, which was the mother in the past, and he gropes forward the, the longing directed towards his mother. Nature acquires a hidden maternal significance for him, Doe, in the tones of nature he discovers a suggestion of the maternal voice in the maternal language. Quote, Siegfried, Thou gracious birdling, stranger, strange art thou to me. Dost thou in the wood there here dwell? Ah, would that I could take thy meaning, thy song, something would say, perchance, of my loving mother. This psychology we have already encountered in Hiawatha, by means of his dialogue with the bird, bird like wand and arrow, presents the wish, the winged longing. Siegfried entices Fafner from his cave. His desires turn back to the mother and the cath and the Cathronic dreams, the cave-dwelling terror of the woods, appears. Fafner is the producer of the treasure. In his cave lies the horde, the source of life and power. The mother possesses the libido of the sun, and jealousy, jealously does she guard it. Translated into psychological language, this means the pos positive transfer succeeds only through the release of the libido from the mother imago, the incestuous object in general. Only in this matter is it possible to gain one's libido, the incomparable treasure, and this requires a mighty struggle, the whole battle of adaption. Uh, footnote from Faust, part two. Uh, this is in German, so I'm not going to read it, sorry. The Siegfried legend has abundantly described the outcome of this battle with the Fafner. According to the, to, to the Edda, Siegfried eats Fafner's heart, the seed of life. He wins the magic cat, through whose power Albrecht has changed himself into a serpent. This refers to the motive of, motive of casting the skin and rejuvenation. By means of the magic cap, one can vanish and assume different shapes. The vanishing probably refers to dying and to the invisible presence that is existence in the mother's womb. A luck-bringing cap, amniotic covering, the newborn child occasionally wears over his head the call. Moreover, Siegfried drinks the dragon's blood, which makes it possible for him to understand the language of the birds, and consequently he enters into a peculiar relation with nature, a dominating position, the result of his knowledge, and finally he wins the treasure. Hort is a medieval and old high German word with the meaning of collected and guarded treasure. Gothic hoods, old Scandinavian hod, Germanic hauts, from the free German kudzho, for could tho, the concealed kluge, um, adds this to this the Greek um, zutho, ek, uthon, to hide, to conceal, and also hut, hut, to guard, English hide, Germanic root hood, from the Indo Germanic kuth, questionable, to Greek xutho, and xuthos, captivity, feminine genitals, preswil, two traces, Gothic. Hoods, Anglo-Saxon hide, English hide and hoard, to Greek 
ksu tho tho Whitley Strokes traces English hide, Anglo Saxon Haydn, New High German Hut, Latin Kudo helmet, Sanskrit Kudhara cave to primitive Celtic Kudo concealment, Latin Ocul Ocultatio Tatio. The assumption of Kluge is also supported in another directions, namely from the point of view of the primitive idea. Quote, there exists in Athens a sacred place at Timinos of Gay, with the surname Olympia. Here the ground is torn up open for about a yard in width, and they say after the flood at the time of Deucalion du that the water receded here, and every year they throw into the fissure a oh, wheat meal kneaded with honey. End quote. We have observed previously that among the Arhitof Forian pastry in the form of snakes and fallae was thrown into the crevice of the earth. This was mentioned in connection with the ceremony of fertilizing the earth. We have touched again already upon the sacrifice in the earth crevice among the Wachichandis. The flood of death has passed characteristically into the crevice of the earth, that is, back into the mother again, because from mother the universal great depth has come in the first place. The flood is simply the counterpart of the vivifying and all-producing water. Um, so que now os reper genesis pantiso tetuxai. Translation, ocean who arose to be the producer of all. One sacrifices the honey cake to the mother so that she may spare one from death. Thus, every year in Rome, a gold sacrifice was thrown into the Lactus Curtius, into the former fissure in the earth, which could only be closed through the sacrificial death of Curtius. He was the typical hero who had journeyed into the underworld in order to conquer the danger threatening the Roman state from the opening of the abyss. Caeneus Amphireos. In the Amphire. Phaeron of Oropus, whose hues, those healed through the temple incubation, threw their grits, gifts of gold into the sacred well, of which Pausanias says, If any one is healed of a sickness through a saying of the oracle, then it is customary to throw a silver or gold coin into the well, because here Amphireos has ascended as a god. It is probable that this Oropic well is also the place of his catabasis, descent into the lower world. There were many entrances into Hades in antiquity. Thus, near Eleusios, there was an abyss through which Adonius passed up and down when he kidnapped Cora, dragon and maiden, the libido overcome by resistance, life, represented, life replaced by birth. There were crevices in the rocks through which souls could ascend to the upper world. Behind the temple of Cathonia in Hermione lay a sacred district of Pluto with a raven with uh, sorry, with a ravine through which Hercules had brought up Cerebus. In addition there was the Archerusian Lake. Um, this ravine was, therefore, the entrance to the place where death was conquered. The lake also belongs here as a further mother symbol, for symbols appear massed together as they are surrogates, and therefore do not afford the same satisfaction of desire as accorded by, by reality, so that the unsatisfied remnant of the libido must seek all still further symbolic outlets. The ravine in the Areopagus in Athens was considered the seat of inhabitants of the lower world. An old Grecian custom suggests a similar idea. Girls were sent into a cavern where a poisonous snake dwelt as a test of virginity. If they were bitten by the snake, it was told the token they were no longer chaste. We find that the same motive again in the Roman legend of St. Sylvester at the end of the 5th century. Erate Draco in Massimus, in Monte Tarpeo, in Quo est Capitolium col locatum, ad hunc draconer per, and the, there's the number, 
gradus, quasi ad infernatum magicum virginibus sacrilegis, de san dibant semul in mensicum sacri sacricis et lustris, ex quibus escap poterat tantor arconi inferi. Hic draco subito ex improviso ascendibat et licti non in gradet Gra in gradereter vicinos tamen aris flut sub suo, suo vitiabat ex quo, quo mortalitas hominem et maxima luctus de morta venibat in phantom lilith Sanctus itaque silvestre cum cabiret cum paginas pro defon defensione veritatis conflictum ad hoc venit un et dicterent et pugati. Quote, silvestre descendi ad dragon et fac ium in nome deu tiu vel un anno ab infer Interfectioni generis humani cesare. Um, so we'll translate this here. There was a huge dragon in Mount Tiberius, where the Ca Capitolotheum stands. Once a month, with sacrilegious maidens, the priest descended 365 steps into the hell of this dragon, carrying expiatory offerings of food for the dragon. Then the dragon suddenly and unexpectedly arose, and though he did not come out, he poisoned the air with his breath. Thence came the morality of men and the deepest sorrow for the death of the children. When, for the defense of truth, St. Sylvester had had a conflict with the heathen, it came to this, and the heathen said, Sylvester, go down to the dragon in the name of the god. Make him to desist from the killing of mankind. St. Peter appeared to Sylvester in a dream and advised him to close his door to the underworld with chains, according to the model of Revelations, chapter 20. Quote, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him. The anonymous author of a writing, D. Promissionibus um, of the beginning of the 5th century mentions a very similar legend. Apud urbem romanum spectus quidam fuit in quo draco menaer magnitudinis mecane arte formactus gladium ore gestans. So footnote to this. Like his counterpart, the apocalyptic son of man from whose mouth proceeds a two-edged sword. Revelations compare Christ as serpent and the Antichrist seducing the people. Revelations 23. We come across the same motive of the guardian dragon who pierces women in the myth of Van Diamond's land. To quote, a horn back lay in the captivity of a rock, a huge horn back. The horn back was large, and he had a very long spear. From his captivity he espied the woman. He saw the, them dive into the water. He pierced them with his spear. He killed them. He carried them away. For some time they were to be seen no longer. The monster was then killed by two heroes. They made fire and brought the woman to life again. All right. So, Ochilis Rut... <laughs> Rutilantibus gemis, footnotes the sun. The eyes of the son of man are like the flame of fire, Revelations 1 15. Metaidus ac terribilis apparebat. Hinc anoe devotae virginis floribus exonate eum modo in sacrificio dabantur quaetinus in skias. Munare defende dif, dif, ferendis gradem scale, quor surte ille arta diaboli draco pendibat, contigentis impetus vientis gladi perimerit, ut sun giatum fonderet in noc, in noc entem, 
et hunc quidam monacus bene ob meritum cognitas, stiliconi tunc patrico eo modo subverti baculo, baculo manu singulus grandus palpandos in sepiciens statim et ulum tangens fraudulent diabo, diabolicam reparit io transgresso te sandens draconem scidit messitice in partes ostendens et hic deos non esse qui manufuent Translated, near the city of Rome there was a certain cavern in which appeared a dragon of remarkable size and mechanically produced, bending a sword in his mouth, his eyes glittering like gems, fearful and terrible. Hither came virgins every year, devoted to this service, adorned with flowers, who were given to him in sacrifice. Bringing these gifts, they unknowingly descended the steps to a point where, with diabolical, diabolical cunning, the dragon was suspect, suspended, striking those who came with a blow with the sword, so that the innocent blood was sh shed. Now there was a certain monk, who, on account of his good deeds, was well known to Stilico, the, patri but the, patri the patrician. He killed the strike and as follows. He examined each separate step carefully, both with a rod and his old hand, until, discovering the false step, he exposed the diabolical fraud. Then, jumping over the step, he went down and killed the dragon, cutting him to pieces, demonstrating that one who could be destroyed by human hand could not be a divinity. There we go. The hero battling with the dragon has much in common with the dragon, and also he takes over his qualities, for example, in vulnerability. As the footnote shows, the similarity is carried still further, sparkling eyes and sword in his mouth. Translated psychologically, the dragon is merely the son's repressed longing, striving towards the mother, and therefore the son is the dragon, as even Christ is identified with the serpent, which, once upon a time, similar similia similibus, had controlled the snake plague in the wilderness. John 3.14. As a serpent, he is to be crucified, that is to say, as one striving backwards towards the mother, he must die hanging or suspended on the mother tree. Christ and the dragon of the Antichrist are in close closest contact in the history of their appearance in their cosmic meeting. Compare Bousset the Antichrist. <clears throat> the legend of the dragon concealed in the Antichrist myth belongs to the life of the hero and therefore is immortal. In none of the newer forms of myth are the pairs of opposites so perceptibly near as in that of Christ and the Antichrist. I refer to the remarkable, remarkable psychologic description of this problem in Mirkir Cho. Cho, uh, Emir Cho, Cho, Tchaikovsky's romance, Leonardo da Vinci. That the dragon is only an artifice is a useful and delightedly rationalistic conceit, which is most significant for that period. In this way, the dismal gods are effectively vulgarized. The schizophrenic insane readily make use of this mechanism in order to depreciate the effective personalities. One often hears the stereotypical lament, it is all a play, artificial, made up, etc. A dream of a schizophrenic has most significant. He is sitting in a dark room, which has only a single small window, through which you can see the sky. The sun and the moon appear, but they are only made artificially from oil paper, denial of the deleterious incest influence. The descent of the 365 steps refers to the sun's course to the cavern of the death and rebirth. This cavern actually stands in the relation to the subterranean mother of death, can be shown as an, by the note of Malalas in the history, the historian of Antioch, um, who relates that Diocletian consecrated there a crypt to Hecate, to which no one descends by three hundred and by to which to which one does descend by three hundred and sixty-five steps. Cave mysteries seem to have been celebrated for Hecate and Semothrace as well. The serpent also played a great part as a regular symbolic attribute in the, servit in the service of Hecate. The mysteries of Hecate flourished in Rome towards the end of the 4th century so that the two foregoing legends might also relate to her cult. Hecate um, is a real spectral goddess of night and phantoms, a mar. She is represented as riding and in the Hesiod occurs as a patron of writers. 
She sends the horrible nocturnal fear phantom, the Empusa, of whom Aristophanes says that she appeared clo- enclosed in the bladder swallowed with bl- sw- swollen with blood. According to Libanios, the mother of Aichinis is also called impra- Impasa for the reason that ek skotainaun tapaun tois paisin kai tais gu naiksin aur mato. Translation. Out of the dark places she rushed, she rushed on children and women. Impasa, like Hecate, has peculiar feet. One foot is made of brass, the other of ass's dung. Hecate has snake-like feet, which, as in the ter- triple form ascribed to Hecate, points to her phallic libido nature. In Trallis, Hecate, pe- Hecate appears next to Priapus. There is also Hecate, Aphrodisias. Her symbols are the key, footnote, Faust, two, part two, the scene of the mother, the key belongs to Hecate, Prothuraya as the guardian of Hades, the psychopomp divinity, compared to Janus, Peter, and Aeon. The whip, footnote, a tribute of the terrible mother, Ishtar has tormented the horse with goad and whip and tortured him to death, Jensen in the, Gigl- G- in the Gilgamesh epic, also an attribute of Helios, and the snake, phallic symbol of fear. The dagger, murderous weapon, a symbol of the fructifying phallus, and the torch, Plato has already testified to this in the phallic symbol as mentioned above. As, a, as mother of death, dogs accompany her, the significance of which we have previously discussed at length. As guardian of the door of Hades, and as goddess, goddess of dogs, she is threefold form, and really identified with Cerebus. Thus, Hercules, in bringing up Cerebus, brings the conquering mother of death into the upper world. As spirit mother, moon, she sends madness and lunacy. This mythical observation states that the mother sends madness. By far, the majority of the cases of insanity consist, in fact, in the domination of the individual by the maternal incest fantasy. In the Mysteries of Cerebus, a rod called Lucophololus, a white-leaved, was broken off. This rod protected the purity of virgins and caused anyone who touched the plant to become insane. We recognize this in the motive of the sacred tree, which, as mother, must not be touched. An act which not only an insane person would, com- which which only an insane com- person would commit. Hecate, as a nightmare, appears in the form of Impasa in a vampire role, as or as Lamia, the devourer of men. Perhaps also in a more beautiful guise, the Bride of Corinth. She is the mother of all charms and witches, the patron of Medea, because the power of the terrible mother is magical and irresistible, working upon upward from the unconscious. In Greek. Synchronis- syn- syncretism, she plays a very significant role. She is confused with Artemis, who also has the surname Ekate, meaning far shooting Hecate, the one striking at a distance or striking according to her will, in which we recognize again her superior power. Artemis is the huntress with hounds, and so Hecate, through confusion with her, becomes um, Xu- Xune. Get ix, sorry, Zune Getixi, the wild nocturnal huntress, god as huntsman, see above. She has her name in common with Apollo, Exatos Ekaigos, which means far shooting, far darting. From the standpoint of the libido theory, this connection is easily understandable because Apollo merely symbolizes the more positive side of the same amount of libido. The confusion of Hecate with Brimo is a subterranean mother is understandable, also with Persephone and Rhea, the primitive all-mother. Intelligible, though, the maternal significance is the confusion with Ilthaitha, the midwife. Hecate is also the direct goddess of births. Um, Kurotopophos, goddess of birth, the multiplier of cattle and the goddess of marriage. Hecate, Orphaically, occupies the center of the world as Aphrodite and Gaia, even as the world soul is in general. On a carved gem, she is represented as carrying the cross on her head. 
the beam on which the criminal was scourged is called exate, hecate. To her, as to the Roman trivi trivia, the triple rods or skindweg, forked road, or crossed ways are dedicated. And where roads branch off or unite, sacrifices of dogs were brought to her. There the bodies of the executed were thrown. The sacrifice occurs at the point of crossing. Etymologically, chaid, sheath, for example, sword sheath, sheath for water shell, and sheath for vagina is identified with chaid, to split or to separate. The meaning of a sacrifice at this place would, therefore, be as follows. To offer something to the mother at the place of junction or at the fissure compared to the sacrifice of, to the Chironic, Chironic gods in the abyss. The Timenos of Gay, the abyss and the well, are easily understood as the gates of life and death. Footnote. Compare the symbolism in the hymn to Mary of Milk, 12th century. Santa Maria, closed gate opened to God's command, sealed fountain, barred garden, gate of paradise. The same symbolism occurs in an erotic verse. Maiden, may I enter with you into your rose garden, there where the little green, the little red roses grow, those delicate and tender roses, with a tree close by whose leaves sway to and fro, and a cool little brook which lies directly beneath it. End of footnote. So, the T gates of life and death, we read that footnote, past which every one gladly creeps, Faust sacrifices there his obolos and his pelanoi, the sacrificial cakes offered to the gods, instead of his body, just as Hercules soothes Cerebus with the honey cakes. Compare with this the myth mythical significance of the dog. Thus the crevice at Delphi with the spring Castelia was the seat of the Chthonic dragon, Python, who was conquered by the sun hero, Apollo. Python, incited by Hera, pursued Leda, pregnant with Apollo, but she, on the floating island of Delos, nocturnal journey on the sea, gave birth to her child, who later slew the Python, that is to say, conquered in it the spirit mother. In Hierapolis, Edisa, the temple was erected, above the crevice through which the, flo the flood was poured out, and in Jerusalem the foundation stone of the temple covered with a giant, uh, the great abyss, just as Christian churches are frequently built over caves, grottoes, wells, etc. In the Mithra grotto, um, footnote, a Mithric sanctuary was, when at all possible, a subterranean grotto. grotto. Often the cavern was merely an artificial one. It is conceivable that the Christian crypts and subterranean churches or of similar meaning. So in the mythic grotto and all other sacred caves up to the Christian catacombs, which owe their significance not to the legendary persecutions but to the worship of the dead, we come across the same fundamental motive, the burial of the dead in a holy place, in the garden of the dead, in cloisters, crypts, etc., is restitution to the mother with a certain hope of resurrection by which some, such burial is rightfully rewarded. The animal of death which dwells in the cave has to be soothed in early times through human sacrifice, later with natural gifts. Footnote, in the Tauroboli, a bull was sacrificed over a grave in which lay one to be consecrated. His initiated initiation consisted in being covered with the blood of the sacrifice, also a regeneration and rebirth or a baptism. The baptized one was called Renatus. Therefore, end of footnote, therefore the Attic custom gives to the dead, um, Melitopu, to pacify the dog of hell, the three-headed monster in the gates of the underworld. A more recent elaboration of the natural gift seems to be the Olobo obolos for Chiron, who is therefore dis designated uh, by road as a second Cerebus, corresponding to the Egyptian dog-faced god Anubis. Dog and serpent of the underworld, dragon, are likewise identical. In the tragedies, the, Arithi the Arians are serpents as well as dogs. The serpent Tyron and Echidna are parents of the serpents. Hydra, the dragon of the Hephaerides, and Gorgo, the, and, of all, and of the dogs, Cerebus, Orthrus, and Scylla. Serpents and dogs are also protectors of the treasure. The Cathronic god was probably always a serpent dwelling in a cave and was fed p 
Pilanoi, ritual food offered to the gods. In the Asclepiadian of the later period, the sacred serpents were scarcely visible, meaning that they probably existed only figuratively. Footnote. Indeed, serpent, um, sacred serpents were kept for display and other purposes. End of footnote. Nothing was left but the hole in which the snake was said to dwell. There was Pilanoi, ritual food offered to the gods. There Pilanoi was placed. Later, Obolus was thrown in. The sacred cave in the temple of Kos consisted of a rectangular pit upon which was laid a stone lid with a square hole. This arrangement served the purpose of a treasure house. The sacred the snake hole had become a slit for money, a sacrificial box, and the cave has become a treasure. That this development, which Herzog traces, agrees ex excellently with the actual condition, is shown by the discovery of the temple of uh, Asclepius and Hygieia in Ptolemaeus. Quote, An encoiled granite stake, snake with arched neck was found. In the middle of the coil is seen a narrow slit polished by usage, just large enough to allow a coin of four centimeters diameter at most to fall through. At the sides are holes for handles to lift the heavy pieces, and under half of which is used as a cover. Herzog. End of quote. Um, the serpent, as protector of the horde, now lies in the treasure house. The fear of the maternal womb of death has become the guardian of the treasure of life. That the snake in this connection is really a symbol of death, that is to say of the dead libido, results from the fact that the souls of the dead, like the Chthronic gods, appear as serpents, as dwellers in the kingdom of the mother of death. Um, this development of symbol allows us to recognize easily the transition of the originally very primitive significance of the crevice in the earth as mother to the meaning of the treasure house, and can therefore support the etymology of hort, hoard treasure as suggested by Klug, Kluthou, belonging to Kluthos, meaning the innermost womb of the earth, Hades, Kustos, that Klug adds in, is of similar meaning, cavity or womb. Perret's will does not mention this connection. Fick, however, compares New High German Hort, Gothic Huds, and Armenian Kuts, Abdomen, Church Slovenian Ksista, Vedic Kosa, equals Abdomen from the Indo Germanic root Kustos, Viscera, Lower Abdomen, Room, Storeroom. Preswell compares Kuthos, kustis was a urinary bladder, bag, or a purse in Sanskrit. Kuthas, cavity, cavity of the loins, then. Kutos, cavity, equals vault. Kutis, little chest, from Ksnui, I am pregnant, here from. Kuthos, ca cave, Ksurar, suar, hole. Kualthos, cup, kula, depression under the eye. Xuma, swelling, wave, bellows. Kuros, power, force. Krios, lord. Old Iranian, kaurkur, hero. Sanskrit, kuras, strong, hero. The fundamental Indo-Germanic roots are kivo, to swell, to be strong. From the above mentioned, qa, qa, kurar, kuros, in Latin, cavus, hallowed, vaulted, cavity, hole. Cavia, cavity, enclosure, cage, seen in assembly. Caule, cavity, opening, enclosure, stall. Footnote. Compare the stable clearing of Her Heracles. The stable, like the cavern, is a place of birth. We find stable and cavern in the Mithraism combined with the bull symbolism in, as in Christianity. In the Basuto myth, um, the stable birth occurs. The stable birth belongs to the mythologic animal fable. Therefore, the legend of the conception a conceptio immaculata, allied to the history of the impregnation of the baron Sarah, appears very earthy in Egypt as an animal fable. Herodotus the third twenty eight relates This Apis of Ephastos is a calf whose mother was unable to become impregnated, but the Egyptians said that a ray from heaven fell upon the cow, and from that for from that she brought forth Apis. Apis symbolizes the sun. Therefore, his sign upon the forehead of a white spot, with his back a figure of an eagle, upon his tongue a beetle.
and a footnote. So we go on. Cuillo swell principle, cuillance swelling, en cuillance pregnant, ic exudion Latin, inciens impregnant, compare Sanskrit, vica, vic vayan swelling, kudos strong, powerful hero. The treasure which the hero fetches from the dark cavern is swelling life. It is himself, the hero, newborn from the anxiety of pregnancy and the birth rose. Thus, the Hindu for firebringer is pregnancy and the fire and the birth rose. Oh, sorry. Thus, the Hindu firebringer is called Matri Matrikvan. Sorry about that last sentence. I messed up. Mr. Matrikvan, meaning the one swelling in the mother. The hero striving towards the mother is the dragon, and when he separates from the mother, he becomes the conqueror of the dragon. Footnote. According to Philo, the servant is the most spirited of all the element animals. Its nature is that of fire. The rapidity of its movements is great, and this without need of any special limbs. It has a long life and sheds age with its skin. Therefore, it is incul inculcated in the mysteries because of its immortality. End footnote. This train of thought, which we have already hinted at previously in Christ and Antichrist, may be traced even into the details of Christian fantasy. There is a series of medieval pictures, footnote, for example, the St. John Quintum Astius, also two pictures by unknown Strasbourg master in the Galley of Strasbourg, um, in which the communion cup contains a dragon, a snake, or some sort of small animal, footnote, and the woman having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornications. fornications. Revelations uh, 20, I'm oh, sorry, um, 17, 4. The woman is drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. A striking image of the terrible mother here, copical genitals. In the Tibetan, in the Tibetan myths, the Bogda Gersher Khan, there is a beetle, treasure attained with difficulty which the demonic old woman guards. Gesser says to her, Sister, never since I was born have you shown me the beetle, my soul. The mother libido is also the soul. It is significant that the old woman desires the hero as a husband for Benius. End of that footnote. Um, the cup is the receptacle, the maternal womb, of the god resurrected in the wine. The cup is the cavern where the serpent dwells, the god who sheds his skin in the state of metamorphosis, for Christ is also the serpent. These symbolisms these symbolisms are used in an obscure connection to 1 Corinthians verse 1, 10. Paul writes of the Jew who, Jews who were all baptized unto M Moses in the cloud and in the sea, also reborn, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that, follow, that followed through them, and that rock was Christ. They drank from the mother, the generative rock, birth of the rock, the milk of rejuvenation, the meat of immortality, and this rock was Christ, here identified with the mother, because he is the symbolic representative of the mother libido. When we drink from the cup, then we drink from the mother's breast immortality and everlasting salvation. Paul wrote of the Jews that they ate and then rose up to dance and to indulge in fornication, and then 23,000 of them were swept off by the plague of the serpents. The remedy for the survivors, however, was the sight of the serpent hanging on a pole. From it was derived the cure. Quote, the cup of blessings which we bless, it is not the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break, is, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread, one body, for we all partake, are all partakers of one bread. 1 Corinthians Bread and wine are the body and blood of Christ. The food of the immortals are their brothers with Christ. Idelphoi, those who come from the same womb. We who are reborn again from the mother are all heroes through, together with Christ and enjoy immortal food. As with the Jews, so too with the Christians, there is imminent danger of unworthy partaking for this mystery, which is very closely related psychologically with the subterranean hierogamos of Eleusius, involves a mysterious union of man in a spiritual sense. Footnote. There is also significance of the mysteries. Their purpose is to lead the useless regressive ancestors libido over the binges of symbolism into rational activity. And through that transformation... 
the obscure compulsion of the libido working up from the unconscious into the social communion and higher moral endeavor. So, and a footnote, so, which is closely related psychologically with a subterranean higher Rogasmos of Eleusius involves a mysterious union of man in a spiritual sense, and we had the footnote, which was constantly misunderstood by the profane and was re retranslated into his language, where mystery is equivalent to orgy and secrecy to vice. And footnote. An excellent example of this is the description of the orgies of the Russian sectarian by Merich Kowski in his book Peter the Great in Alexandria, in the cult of the aesthetic goddesses of love. Anaitis Mailita, prostitution in the temple was an organized institution. The orgiastic cult of Anahita, Anaitis, has been preserved in modern sex with the Ali Ilhaji, the so called extinguishers of light, with the Yezeds and the Duke Shikurds, who celebrate nocturnal religion orgies which end in a wild sexual debauch, during which incestuous unions also occur. Further examples are to be found in the valuable work of Stoll. End of that footnote. Um, a very interesting blasphemer and secretarian of the beginner of the 19th century named Uter Ahrer has made the following comment in the, on the Last Supper. The communion of the devil is in this brothel. All they sacrifice here they sacrifice to the devil and not to God. There they have the devil's cup and the devil's dish. There they have sucked the head of the snake. And he says, footnote, concerning the kiss of the snake, compare Grimm. By this means a beautiful woman was set free. The sucking refers to the maternal significance of the snake, which exists along with the phallus. It is a coitus act on the presexual stage. Um, Spaleran's insane patient says the following. Quote, wine is the blood of Jesus, water must be blessed, and was blessed by him. This one buried alive becomes the vineyard, the wine becomes blood, the water is mingled with childishness, because God says, become like little children. There is also a spermatic water which can be drunken with blood, that perhaps is the water of Jesus. Unquote. Here we find a commingling of all the various meanings of the way to win immortality. Weidemann asserts that it is an Egyptian idea that man draws in the milk of immortality by sucking the breast of the goddess. Compare with the myth of Heracles, where the hero attains immortality by a single draw from the breast of Hera. So, and a footnote. So, where they sucked from the head of the snake, where they had fed upon the in, 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 in quitious bread and drunk on the wine of the wickedness. Footnote to wickedness from the writing of the secretary in Ashton. Unter Nacher. I owe the acknowledgement of the fragment to Reverend Dr. Okay, Fister. Okay. So facing this is a picture of St. John with a chalice and serpent. So it's a famous painting. You can just look it up. St. John with chalice and serpent. And you'll see a serpent coming out of the, the cup, the chalice. We go on. Unter Nacher is an adherent or a forerunner of the theory of living one's own nature. He dreams of himself as a sort of pre effect divinity. He says of himself, quote, Black haired, very charming, and handsome in countenance, and everyone enjoys listening to thee on account of the amiable speeches which come from thy mouth. Therefore, the maids love thee. End quote. He preaches, quote, The cult of nakedness. And so here we have some quote. Ye fools and blind men, behold, God has created man in his image, as male and female, and has blessed them, and said, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and make it subject to thee. Therefore he has given the greatest honor to those poor members, and has placed them naked in the garden, etc. Now are the fig leaves and the covering removed, because thou hast turned to the Lord, for the Lord is the Spirit, and the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. Footnote Nietzsche, compared Nietzsche, Zarathustra. And I also give this parable to you. Not a few who wish to drive out the devil from themselves by that led themselves into the slough. End of footnote. There, the clearness of the Lord is mirrored with uncovered countenance. This is precious before God, and this is the glory of the God and the adornment of our God. When you stand in the image and honor of your God, and God created you naked and not ashamed. 
Who can ever praise sufficiently in the sons and the daughters of the living God, whose parts of the body, which are destined to procreate? In the lap of the daughter of Jerusalem is the gate of the Lord, and the just will go into the temple there and to the altar. Footnote. Compared to the vision of Zoisimos. And in the lap of the sons of the living God is the water pipe of the utter, utter, upper part, which is a tube like a rod to measure the temple on the altar. And under the water tube, the sacred stones are placed and is a symbol and a testimony, testimony to the Lord who has taken to himself the seed of Abraham. Out of the seeds and in the chamber of the mother, God creates a man with his hands as an image of himself. And then the mother house and the mother chamber is opened and the daughters of the living God and God himself brings forth children among them. Thus God creates children from the stones and, this, and from the seed comes the stones. So end of, uh, then a footnote, end of quote. The significance of the communion ritual as a unito mystica with God is, a bo is at bottom sexual and very corporeal. This primitive significance of the communion is that of hierogamos. Therefore, in the fragment of the Addis Mysteries handed down for, by Fermicas, it is said that the mystic eats from the Taithamnon and drinks from the um, Kaimamalon, and he confesses uto to paston upaid Duon, which means the same as I have entered the bridal chamber. Usenir, usir, us, er, usenir refers to a series of quotations from the patristic literature, of which I mentioned merely one sentence from the speeches of Proclius of Constantinople. He pastos en a o logos en um fio sorry, few um, stato, teen status, the bridal chamber in which the Logos has espoused of flesh. The church is also, to some extent, the bridal chamber where the spirit unites with the flesh, really the comerterium. Arineos mentions more on some of the initiatory customs of certain Gnostic sects, which were undoubtedly nothing but spiritual weddings. In the Catholic Church, even yet, a hierogamos is celebrated in the, on the installation of a priest. A young maiden there represents the church as bride. End of footnote. History teaches in manifold examples of how the religious mysteries are liable to change suddenly into sexual orgies because they have originated from an overvaluing of the orgy. It is it is a characteristic this this preopic divinity footnote compare also the fantasies of um, Felician ropes the crucified preopus and footnote returns again to the old symbol of the snake which in the mystery enters into the faithful fertilizing and spiritualizing them although it is originally possessed a phallic significance in the mysteries of the ophites the festival was really celebrated with serpents, in which the animals were even kissed. Compare the caressing of the snake of Demeter in the Elysian Mysteries. In the sexual orgies of the modern Christian sex, the phallic kiss plays a very important role. Uternahar was an uncultivated crazy, crazy peasant, and it is unlikely, unlikely that the Orphic ritual ceremonies were known to him. The phallic significance is expressed negatively or mysteriously through the serpent, serpent, which always points to a secret related thought. This related thought connects with the mother. Thus, it is a, in a dream, a patient found the following imagery, quote, a serpent shot out from a moist cave and bit the dreamer in the region of the genitals, unquote. The dream took place at the instant when the patient was convinced of the truth of the analysis and began to free himself from the bond of his mother complex. The meaning is, I am convinced that I am inspired and poisoned by my mother. The contrary manner of expression is characteristic of the dream. At the moment when he felt the impulse to go forward, he perceived the attachment to the mother. Another patient had the following dream during a relapse in which the libido was again wholly introverted for a time. Quote, she was entirely filled within by a great snake. Only one end of the tail peeped out from her arm. She wanted to seize it, but it escaped her. End quote. A patient with a very strong introversion catatonic state, complained to me that a snake was stuck in her throat. Uh, but no, compare with the symbolism of Nietzsche's poem. Quote, Why enticest thou thyself into the paradise of thy old serpent? End quote. 
This symbolism is also used by Nietzsche in the vision of the shepherd and the snake. Footnote, the spark there, Thurstra. Quote, Did I ever see so much disgust and pallid fear upon the countenance? And here a footnote, Nietzsche himself must have shown at times a certain predilection for loathing an, for loathsome animals. Um, end footnote. Might he have been sleeping and the snake crept into his mouth? There it bit him fast. My hand tore at the serpent and tore in vain. I failed to tear the serpent out of his mouth. Then there cried out of me, Bite! Bite! Its head off. Bite! I exclaimed. All my horror, my hate, my disgust, my compassion, all the good and bad cried out for me in one voice. Ye intrepid ones around me, solve for me the riddle which I saw. Make clear to me the vision of the loathsome one. For it was a vision and a prophecy. What did then I behold in parable? And who is it who still, who is still to come? Who is the, that, the shepherd into whose mouth crept the snake? Who is the man into those whose throat all the heaviness and blackest would creep? Footnote. I recall Nietzsche's dream, which I cited in part one of this book. End footnote. But the shepherd bit, as my cry told him. He bit with a huge bite. Far away did he split the head of the serpent and sprang up. No longer shepherd, no longer man, a transfigured being, an eliminated being who laughed. Not yet on earth did a man laugh as he laughed. Oh, my brethren, I heard a laugh, which was no human laughter, and now a thirst consumeth me, a longing that is never allayed. My longing for this laugh eats into me. Oh, how I can! How can I suffer still to live, and how can I bear to die? But note, the Germanic myth of Dietrich von Bern who had fiery breath, belongs to this idea. He was wounded in the forehead by an arrow, a piece of which remained there fixed, and this he has called the immortal. In a similar manner, half of Hadugnu's wedge-shaped stone fastened itself in Thor's head. See Grimm Mythology. The snake represents the inverting libido. Through introversion, one is fertilized, inspired, regenerated, and reborn from the god. In Hindu philosophy, this idea of creative intellectual activity even has cosmogenic significance. The unknown original creator of all things is, according to Rig Veda 10.121, Prajapati, the lord of creation. In the, in the various Brahmins, his cosmogenic activity was depicted in the following manner. Quote, Prajapati desired, I will procreate myself. I will be manifold. He performed tapas. And after he performed tapas, he created these worlds. End quote. The strange consumption of tapas is to be translated, according to Dusen, as, quote, he heated himself with his own heat. Quote, uh, footnote. So tapo at piata. With this end of footnote. With the sense of he brooded, he hatched. Here the hatcher and the hatched are not two, but one and the same identical being. As um, here an garya, gayar ba prajapati is the egg produced produced from himself, the world egg from which he hatches himself. He creeps into himself, he becomes his own uterus, becomes pregnant with himself in order to give birth to the world of multiplicity. Thus prajapati, through the way of introversion, changed into something new the multiplicity of the world. It is of a special interest to note how the most remote things come into contact. Dusen observes, In the degree that the conception of tapas heat becomes in hot India the symbol of exertion and distress, the tapo atapiata began to assume the meaning of self-castigation and became related to the idea that creation is an act of self-renunciation on the part of the creator. Self-incubation and self-castigation and introversion are very closely connected ideas. Footnote. The Stoic idea of the creative primitive, oh sorry, the creative primal warmth in which we have already recognized the libido, part one, chapter four, belongs to this con connection. Also the birth of Mithra from a stone, which resulted solo astis lib libidinus through the heat of the libido only. End of footnote. The Zosimos vision mentioned above betrays the same train of thought, where it is said of the place of transformation, O torpos tes asci dios, the place of discipline. 
We have already observed that the place of transformation is really the uterus. Absor absorption in oneself, introversion, is an entrance into one's own uterus, and also at the same time aestheticism. In the philosophy of the Brahmins, the word arose from this activity. Among the post-Christian Gnostics, it produced the revival and the spiritual rebirth of the individual who was born into a new spiritual world. The Hindu philosophy is considerably more daring and logical and assumes that creation results from introversion in general, and in the wonderful hymn of Rigveda it is said, quote, What has hidden in the shell was born through the power of fiery torments. From this first arose love as the germ of knowledge. The wise found the roots of existence and non-existence by investigating the heart's impulses. A footnote. In the accurate prose translation of this passage, reads, there Kama developed from him in the beginning. Kama is the libido. The, si the sages found the root of being and non-being in the heart, searching within introspection. End of footnote. This philosophical view interprets the world as an emanation of the libido, and this must be widely accepted from the theoretic as well as the psychologic standpoint, for the function of reality is an instinctive function, having the character of biological adaptation. When the insane Schreiber brought about the end of the world through his libido introversion, he expressed an entirely rational psychologic view, just as Schopenhauer wished to abolish through negation, holiness, asceticism, the error of the primal will, through which the world he w was created does not go safe. Quote, you follow a false trail. Do not think that we are not serious. It is not the kernel of nature. It is not the kernel of nature in the, in the hearts of men. End quote. The hero who is to accomplish the rejuvenation of the world and the conquest of death is the libido, which, brooding upon itself in introversion, coiling as a snake around its own egg, apparently threatens life with a poisonous bite in order to lead it to death, and from that darkness conquers itself, gives birth to itself again. Nietzsche knows this conception. Footnote, fame and eternity. The quote, How long have you sat already upon your misfortune? Give heed lest you hatch an egg, a basilisk egg, of your long travail. End quote. The hero is himself a serpent, himself a sacrificer, and a sacrificed. The hero himself is of serpent nature. Therefore, Christ compares himself with the serpent, and therefore the redeeming principle of the world of the Gnostic sect, which styled itself the object, was the serpent. The serpent is the agotho, Agatho and the Kako demon. It is indeed intelligible when, in the Germanic saga, they say that the heroes had serpent's eyes. Footnote, grim mythology, the heroes have serpent's eyes, so do the kings. Omer i Auga, Sigur is called Omer i Auga. End footnote. I recall the parallel previously drawn between the eyes of the Son of Man and those of the Tarpeian dragon. It is already mentioned in the already mentioned medieval pictures, the dragon instead of the Lord appeared in a cup. The dragon, who with changeful serpent glances, footnote Nietzsche, in the green light, happiness still plays around the brown abyss. His voice grows hoarse, his eyes flash their degrees. So the serpent glances guarded the divine mystery of renewed rebirth in the maternal one. In Nietzsche, the old, apparently long-extinct idea is again revived. A footnote from The Poverty of the Richest. And here we have the quote. Ailing with tenderness, just as the thawing wind, Zarathustra sits waiting, waiting on his hill, sweetened and cooked in his own juice. Beneath his summits, beneath his ice, he sits weary and happy, a creator on his seventh day. Silence! It is my truth. From hesitating eyes... From velvety shadows, her glance meets mine, lovely, mischievous, the glance of a girl. She divines the reason of my happiness. She divines me. Ha! What is she plotting? A purple dragon lurks in the abyss of her maiden glances. Footnote to this. Nietzsche fragments of Dionysus Dithrambus. Quote, heavy eyes which seldom love, but when they love it flashes out like a gold mine, where a dragon guards the treasure of love. End of footnote. Um, so, in the abyss of her maiden glance, woe to thee, Zarathustra, thou seemst like some one who has swallowed gold, thy belly will be split open. Uh, footnote, he is pregnant with the sun.
End of the quote. And the footnote. In this poem, nearly all the symbolism is collected, which we have elaborated previously from other connections. The distinct traces of the primitive identity of serpent and hero are still extant in the myth of C. Crops. C. Crops is himself half snake, half man. Originally, he probably was the Athenian snake of the citadel itself. As a buried god, he is like Erch Theus, a, a Chthonic snake god. Above his subterranean dwelling rises the Parthenon, the temple of the virgin goddess. Compare the analogous idea of the Christian church. The casting of the skin of the god, which we have already mentioned in passing, stands in the closest relation to the nature of the hero. We have spoken already of the Mexican god who casts his skin. It is also told of Mani, the founder of the Manichean sect, that he was killed, skinned, and stuffed and hung up. Uh, footnote Galatians 3.27 alludes to this primitive idea. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have been put on Christ. End of footnote. This is the death of Christ merely in another mythologic form. Footnote. Just as in Mani, so is, is Marysias, a crucified one. Both were hung, a punishment which has an unmistakable symbolic value because a suspension to suffer and fear and the torment of suspension is a symbol of an unfulfilled wish. See Freud interpretation of dreams. Um, Therefore Christ, Odin, Atis, hung on tree, equals mother. The Talmudic Jesus ben Pandimera, apparently the earliest hero, historic Jesus, suffered a similar death on the eve of a Passover festival in the reign of Alexander Janaeus, 106-79 BC. This Jesus may have been the founder of the Essen sect, see Robertus Evangemiths, which, should, which stood in a central relation to the subsequent Christianity. The Jesus Ben Stata identified with the preceding Jesus, but removed the second Christian, but, but moved removed into the second cent Christian century was also hung. Both were first stoned, a punishment which was, to spe so to speak, a bloodless one like hanging. The Christian church, which spills no blood, therefore burned. This may be without significance of a peculiar ceremony reported from Uganda. This may not be without significance for a peculiar ceremony repeated from Uganda. Sorry about that. Quote, when a king of Uganda wishes to live forever, he went to a place in Busiro where a feast was given by the chiefs. At the feast, the Mamba clan was especially held in honor, and during the festivities, a member of this clan was secretly chosen by his fellows, caught by them, and beaten to death with their fists. No sticks or other weapons might be used by the man appointed to do the deed. After death, the victim's body was flayed and the skin was made into a special whip, etc. After the ceremony of the feast in Busiro, with its strange sacrifice, the king of Uganda was supposed to live forever, but from that day he was never allowed to see his mother again. The sacrifice, which is cho chosen to purchase everlasting life for another, is here given over to a bloodless death and after that skin. That this sacrifice has an absolutely un mistakable relation to the mother, as we already know, is corroborated by, very plainly by Fraser. End of footnote. Marsyas, who seems to be a substitute for Attis, the sun lover of Sibyl, was also skinned. Whenever a Scythian king died, slaves and horses were slaughtered, skinned, and stuffed, and then sent, set up again. In Phygria, the representatives of the father god were skinned Oh, sorry, killed and skinned. The same was done in Athens with an ox who was skinned and stuffed and hit, again hitched to the plow. In this manner, the revival of the fertility of the earth was celebrated. This readily explains the fragment of the Sabazios mysteries transmitted by, to us by Firmicus. Here, Taupus, Drax, Onos, Kai, Patir, Taupon, Raxon. Translated, the bull, father of the serpent, the serpent, father of the bull. The active fructifying, fructifying, upward striving form of the libido is changed into the negative force striving downwards towards death. The hero, as a zodian of spring, ram bull, conquers the depths of winter and beyond the summer solstice is attacked by the unconscious longing for death and is bitten by the snake. However, he himself is the snake. But he is at war with himself, and therefore the descent and the end appear to him as mali ma malicious inventions of the mother of death, 
who is in this way who in this way wishes to draw him to herself the mysteries however consolingly promise that there is no contradiction footnote another attempt at solution seems to be the de deoscuri motive the sun consists of two brothers similar to each other the one mortal the other immortal this motive is found as is well known in the two akvins who however are not further differentiated in the Mithric doctrine, Mithra is the father, soul the son, and yet both are one, as ho mitus theos helios mithras. The motive of twins emerges, not infrequently in dreams. In a dream, where it is related that a woman has given birth to twins, the dreamer found, instead of the expected children, a box and a bottle-like object. Here the twins had male and female significance. This observation hints at a possible significance of the Ascuri as a son and its rebounding Rebearing mother, a daughter. Question mark. End of footnote. Um, the mist. I'll start the beginning of the sentence. The mysteries, however, consolingly promise that there is no contradiction. We had the footnote, or disharmony when life is changed into death. Taupus drax onos kai taupen tauron raxon. Nietzsche too gives expression to this mystery. Footnote among the daughters of the desert. Here the quote, end of footnote. In the quote, here do I sit now. That is, I'm swallowed down by this smallest oasis. It is opened up, just yawning. Its loveliest maw agape. Hail, hail to the whalefish, for he his guests' welfare provided thus. Hail to his belly, if he had also such a lovely oasis belly. This desert grows. Woe to him who hides the desert. Stone grind on stone, the desert gulps and strangles, the monster of death grazes, glowing brown, and chews his life in his chewing. Forget not, O man, burn out lust. Thou art stone, the desert, thou art death. End quote. The serpent symbolism of the Last Supper is explained by the identification of the hero with a serpent. God is buried and um, it, God is buried in the mother as fruit of the field, as food coming from the mother, and at the same time as drink of immortality. He is received by the mystic, or as a serpent, he unites with the mystic. All these symbols represent liberation of the libido from the incestuous fixation through which new life is attained. The liberation is accomplished under symbols which represent the activity of the incest wish. It might be justifiable at this place to cast a glance upon psychoanalysis of a method of treatment. In practical analysis, it is important, first of all, to discover the libido lost from the control of consciousness. It often happens to the libido with the fishes of Moses in the Mohammedan legend. It sometimes takes its course on a marvelous manner into the sea. Freud says in his important article, Zunt der Nanmik der Ubertagung, quote, um, the libido has retrieved into regression and again revives the infantile images, end quote. This means mythologically that the sun is devoured by the serpent of the night, the treasure is concealed and guarded by the dragon, substitution of a present mode of adaptation by an infantile mode, which is represented by the corresponding neurotic symptoms. Freud continues, quote, Thither the analytic treatment follows it and endeavors to seek out the libido again, to render it accessible to consciousness, and finally to make it serviceable to reality. Whenever the analytic investigation touches upon the libido, withdrawal into its hiding place, a struggle must break out. All the forces which have caused the regression of the libido will rise up as resistance against the work in order to preserve the new condition. End quote. Mythologically, this means the hero seeks the lost son, the fire, the virgin sacrifice of the treasure, and fights the typical fight with the dragon, with the libido in resistance. As these parallels show, psychoanalysis mobiles a part of the life processes, the fundamental importance of which properly illustrates the significance, the significance of this process. After Siegfried has slain the dragon, he meets the father Wotan, plagued by gloomy cares for the primitive mother Erda, has placed in his path a snake in order to enfeeble his son. He says to Erda, quote, Wanderer, all wise one, care's piercing sting by thee was planted in Wotan's dauntless heart, with fear of shameful ruin and downfall, filled with his spirit by tidings thou didst foretell. Art thou the world's wisest of women? Tell me now, how a god may conquer his care, Erdna. Thou art not what thou hast said. End quote. It is the primitive motive which we meet in Wagner. The mother has robbed her son, the son god of the joy of life, through a poisonous thorn, and deprives him of his power, which is connected with the name. 
Isis demands the name of the god. Erdna says, Thou art not what thou hast said, but the wanderer has found a way to conquer the fatal charm of the mother, the fear of death. Quote. The eternal's downfall no more dismays me. Since their doom I willed, I leave to thee, loveliest, while saying, Gladly my heritage now to the ever young in gladness yieldeth the god. End quote. These wise words contain, in fact, the saving thought. It is not the mother who placed the poisonous worm on her path, but our libido itself wills to complete the course of sun to mount from morn to noon and passing beyond noon to hasten towards the evening, not at war with itself, but willing the descent and the end. Footnote. This problem has frequently been explained, employed, I'm sorry, employed in the ancient sun myths. It is especially striking that the lion-killing heroes Samson and Hercules were weaponless in this combat. The lion is the symbol of the most intense summer heat. Astrologically, he is the Dominicilium Solis. Um, Steinthal reasons that this is a most interesting manner, which I quote word for word. Quote, when the sun god fights against the summer heat, he fights against himself. When he kills it, he kills himself. Most certainly, the Phoenician, Assyrian, and, Lithi Li and L Lydian ascribe self-destruction to his sun guide, for he can comprehend the lessening of the sun's heat only as a self-murderer. He believed that the sun stood at the highest in the summer, and its rays scorched the destroying heat. Thus does the god burn himself, but he does not die, only rejuvenates himself. Also Heracles burns himself, but ascends to Olympus in the flames. This is the contradiction in the pagan gods. They, as forces of nature, are helpful as well as harmful to men. In order to do good and to redeem, they must work against themselves. The opposition is dulled. When, when, either, by, when either of the two sides of the forces of nature is personified in an especial god, or when the power of nature is conceived of as a divine personage. However, each of its two modes of action, the benevolent and the injurious, have an especial symbol. The symbol is always independent, and finally is the god himself. When, while originally the god worked against himself, destroyed himself, now symbol fights against symbol, god against god, or the gods with the symbol. End quote. Certainly the gods fight with himself, with his other self, which we have conceived of under the symbol of mother. The conflict always appears to be a struggle with the father and the conquering of the mother. End of quote. Uh, footnote, sorry. Nietzsche Zarathustra teaches, I, pray, quote, I praise thee, my death, the free death, which comes to me because I want it. And when shall I want it? He who had, has a goal and an heir wants death as a proper time for his goal and his heir. And this is the great noonday, when man in the middle of his course stands between man and superman and celebrates his path towards evening as his highest hope, because it is a path to a new morning. He who is settling will bless his own going down, because it is a transition, and the sun of his knowledge will be at high noon. Quote. Siegfried conquers the father Wotan and takes possession of Brunhilde. The first object that he sees is her horse. Then he believes that he beholds a mail-clad man. He cuts to pieces the projecting, the protecting coat of mail of the sleeper, overpowering. When he sees it as a woman, terror seizes him. Quote, My heart doth falter and faint. On whom shall I call, that he may help me? Mother, mother, remember me. Can this be fearing? O oh, mother, mother, thy dauntless child, a woman lay asleep, and now she has taught him to fear. Awaken, awaken, holiest maiden, that life from the sweetest of lips... Will I win me, even though I die in a kiss? End quote. In the duet which follows, the mother is invoked, quote, O mother, hail, who give thee thy birth. End quote. The confession of Brunhilde is especially characteristic. Quote, o, newest, o, o newest joy, joy of the world, how I have ever loved thee. Thou wert my gladness, my care wert thou, my life, thy life I sheltered, or ere it was thine, or ere thou wert born, my shield was thy guard. Now footnote, the old Etruscan custom of covering the urn of ashes and the dead buried in the earth with a shield is something more than mere chance. End of footnote. The pre-existence of the hero and the pre-existence of Brunhilde with his wife-mother are clearly indicated from the passages Siegfried sells in confirmation. Quote, then death took look not upon not sorry, then death took not my mother, bound in sleep did she lie, and quote, the mother imago, which is the symbol of the dying and resurrected libo, libido, is explained by Brunhilde to the hero as his own will, quote, 
thyself am I, if I if best I be in thy love. End quote. The great mystery of the Logos entering into the mother for rebirth is procla- was proclaimed with the following words by Brunhilde. Quote, o Siegfried, Siegfried, conquering light, I love thee ever, for I divined that the, the thought that Wotan had hidden, the thought that I dared not to whisper. Uh, a footnote, incest motive here. Um, that all clearly glowed in my bosom, suffered and strove, for which I flaunted him who conceived it. Same footnote, incest motive. And footnote, for which I, for which in penance prisoned I lay, while thinking it not and feeling only, for in my thought, or should I, you guess it, was only my love for thee. End quote. The erotic similes which now follow distinctly reveal the motive of rebirth, Siegfried. A glorious flood before me rolls with all my senses. I only see its buoyant, gladdening bellows. Though in the deep I find not my face burning, I long for the water's balm, and now I am spring into the steam. Footnote, compared to the idea of the phoenix in the apocalypse of Burnage, part one of this book. So spring in the stream, O oh, might its billows engulf me in bliss. Unquote. The motive of plunging into the maternal water of rebirth baptism is here fully developed. An allusion to the terrible mother Imago, the mother of heroes who teaches them fear, is to be found in Brunhilde's words, the horsewoman who guides death to the other side. Fearest thou, Siegfried? Fearest thou not? The wild, furious woman? The orgiastic Oxidi Mor- Moriturus resounds in Brunhilde's words. Laughing, let us be lost. Laughing, go down to the earth. And in the words... Light giving love, laughing death, end of these quotes, is to be found in the same significant contrast. The further destinies of Siegfried are those of Inviticus. The spear of the gloomy one eyed Hagen strikes Siegfried's a vulnerable spot. The old son, who has become the god of death, the one eyed Wotan, smites his offspring and once again ascends an eternal rejuvenation. The course of the invincible son has supplied the mystery of human life with beautiful and imperishable symbols. It became a comforting fulfillment of the yearning for immortality of all desire of mortals for eternal life. Man leaves as the mother, the source of libido, and is driven by eternal thirst to find her again and to drink renewed from her. Thus he completes his cycle and returns again into the mother's womb. Every obstacle which obstructs his life's path and threatens his ascent wears the shadowy features of the terrible mother, who paralyzes his energy with the conquering poison of the stealthy retrospective longing. In each context, he wins again the smiling love and life-giving mother, images which belong to the intuitive depths of human feeling, the features of which have been become multi mutilated and irrecognizable through the progressive development of the surface of the human mind. The stern necessity of adaptation works ceaselessly to obliterate the last traces of these primitive landmarks of the period of the origin of the human mind and to replace replace them along lines which are to denote more and more clearly the nature of real objects. Reader's Comments so first, while this chapter uses third-person masculine, he, 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 I think that a lot of the psychology is true for, for, for women, even though women do get to give birth. Um, I think that, that a lot of the psychology is true for women. Um, I find it off-putting, the, the third-person masculine. Um, I'm not using women as well to have the things... That, so there there's there's two pieces to this in terms of that there's the 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 part of us that is always dealing with the libido um and the there's a, a part where he says in both these ideas the poet has represented the mythologic symbols of the libido arising from the mother and the libido striving backwards towards the mother and that's where i think that um everybody has that and there's a there's a piece where you know he talks about introversion, um, whereas the libido of mankind is always in advance of his consciousness. Unless his libido calls him forth into new dangers, he sinks into slothful inactivity. Or on the other hand, childish longing for the mother overcomes him on the summit of his existence, and he allows himself to become pitifully weak instead of striving with desperate courage towards the highest. Um, my sense is that is that we all go through um, cycles 
and that that you know certainly a person can spend too much time doing and striving too much time um, being driven in a sense by their libido and certainly they can spend too much time um, intro being in a more introverted restful sort of uh, generative state where you're kind of just or just say just ju gestating state but that it's a cycle and that it, it's a little bit off-putting that he talks about that part of when a person goes into that state in a negative sense which you know is interesting because he spent young spent a lot of time in that state when he was doing the red book and building the stone castle so i think it's really important to honor honor going into those different places and to, but it's nice to be able to see that the being you know whether you're an extrovert or an introvert you go into places where you in your life where you are extroverted or introverted or where you are um, going through different phases and I'm probably saying this all wrong but that it's nice to be able to honor honor those and see that it is about a cycle um, the other thing that I thought about this chapter was that there were parts of it again where he has like the word association that kind of thing where um, and you know him, even his logic about the um, the backwards and forwards being two and one it is seems like kind of schizophrenic logic and you know schizophrenics do have a logic to them they sound like they're crazy but I mean they are crazy but they sound like they're non not logical if you just listen to part but if you actually listen to a schizophrenic there is a logic to them and this chapter has this sort of similar logic of a schizophrenic which isn't a bad thing I think that we again that's something to honor that part of us that can go into something that isn't rational um, that can be you know each of us has the shamanic ability in us but that when we are there you know just as something can be one and another at the same time like in dreams that it's not to be buttoned down that that reality is the reality in that moment and it doesn't necessarily in a sense have a sort of concrete reality which once you write something down in a book it becomes concrete so there's a sort of a, a struggle there and that you know he's writing these things down that are I would say more fluid more sort of like I would think that this was book was more a sort of musings and ways to think about things in a different way instead of saying that you know the libido is this or the 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 mother urge is that last thing I would say is that I think that it's important not to take this stuff literally. That the problems that we have with our mothers, like everybody's got a problem with their mother, right? I mean, if you, if you're a mother, you know that your kid has problems with you because you've been the mother, even though you've done the best you can do. And if you're born, you have a mother, and you've got some kind of problem with your mother. Um, that those problems with our mothers, um, it's nice to kind of look at them in in terms of more mythologic and um, like something that we all share. It's just like we have a tendency to like want to kind of blame our mom so uh it's just part of the cycle i guess even though you know it doesn't mean that it's not a problem <laughs> so those are my comments if you've listened this far you're fantastic amazing wow i doubt anybody has so cheers